for instance, I saw this really bad take. Like, hey, did you know Iran does like uh, se allow sex change surgeries? Oh yeah, like, oh, <laughs> that's wait, because they no, force they gay people that. to yeah. convert. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's up, buddy? How you doing? I'm doing wonderful, man. Um, all right. Well, what's up? Uh, not much. I just saw that you talked about um, Iran on stream for a little bit. It got like two minutes of attention, and mm -hmm. I saw you reading the Iran cables, which I gotta say, I'm really proud of you for going to the source material about Soleimani's influence in Iraq. Oh yeah, um, I yeah. Holy shit, we've done a lot of reading on that. I haven't read the Iran cables yet. I'm like super man. This might sound bad, but like, I I've read some stuff on the Intercept that makes me cringe a little i'm not i'm not entirely sure um there are two authors that i wish I remember their names but like I, i'm not i just am not 100 percent on that site although i was skimming through some of the iran cables and they seem like pretty good but it feels like they definitely have like a particular slant sometimes but okay go for it what's up um okay so uh basically i just wanted to talk to you specifically about you never really like said i didn't see at least because mm -hmm. the only video you put on your youtube and that's usually what i watch if i'm completely honest mm -hmm. um but uh it was like that two minute clip about iran and you kind of like i'm if i'm gonna be honest like I, will you like explain like i i know you probably know a lot more because you're reading iran cables but it seemed like you're explaining it kind of like in baby talk to um like everybody else on stream but that's probably because like you know they're not um, like yeah more, i guess like, i mean yeah what exactly are you asking what do you want to know I wanted to know, like, what's your position on the situation? Or, like, did you, do you think it was a smart move? Do you think it was a good thing to kill Soleimani? Like, I don't know your position. I, man, I really don't fucking know. It's a really hard one. So just some thoughts I have on it are, like, it seems like if we start from the assumption that the United States ought to have a vested interest in protecting its foreign interests, that mm -hmm. Soleimani definitely represented a grave opposition to that and has for a long time. And he's incredibly effective, unprecedentedly effective at, at the organization that he's capable of achieving across multiple countries. So as a yep. target of value that opposes American interests, seems to be really good. Uh, that's a starting from the assumption that like American foreign interests are okay and we ought to defend them. Now, I, now I just don't know what the standard operating procedure here is. Assassinating a target like that in an Iraqi airport is feels yikes to me. I don't know mm -hmm. how the Iraqi people, especially since Soleimani had such a hand in putting together some of the people in that government, I don't know how they would feel knowing that we, by the way, that guy that you invited to Baghdad, we literally just fucking assassinated him on your fucking soil. Yeah, so you saw Eat you shit. saw how he was invited? Um, I Yeah, I think I read it briefly. Remind me. Okay, so basically, this is what I read. And again, mm -hmm. I'm actually still um, calling people about this, like, who's, sure. who, are, who are currently in Baghdad. Like, is this accurate? Because if that is accurate, mm -hmm. then this makes this 10 times worse. Yeah, he was invited on. It was not a secret plane. It wasn't a secret charter. It wasn't an undercover. He was, like, like overtly, like, flying there without, like, covering his tracks or anything. So it seemed like an official invitation from the um, Iraqi. What I've read is it actually had to do something with peace talks, which mm -hmm. if that's accurate, that makes this immediately 10 times worse. Well, did not just from an optics perspective, from an optics perspective. Yeah. But like peace talks make sense from an Iranian point of view. Right. They want mm -hmm. Iran, Iraq and Syria like that, like firewall of of a lot of allied countries with common interests. Holy shit. One, that probably represents a huge threat to America, which we don't want there. And then two, it would be a huge boon to Syria and Iran to, to have Iraq as like a stable and so strong partner for them. Do you them. think yeah. we should like, est like establish, because there's probably a lot of people watching who don't yeah. know really what's going on. Should I establish like what happened? Uh, oh like, yeah, go for like, it. Yeah. And like who Soleimani is because, because I'll be honest, like Soleimani, like I knew like a decent amount about him before, but I think I'm the only person like who actually knew who Soleimani was like on Twitch, like before this actually happened. Probably. Yeah. Go for it. I didn't um, even know the name. So it makes you feel any better. Uh, Trump probably didn't know before he was presented with the option. Oh, either, I can so. confirm he didn't. Know. <laughs> actually, uh, did you see the interview he did before when they asked him about Soleimani? I saw and that. He, that was like four or five years ago. But I guarantee you that, like, even as president, I don't think he knew dig all about no, him until it was. No, presented. no, no. But, yeah. There's no way in hell. There's mm -hmm. no way in hell. Trump, Trump. From everything I've read, from like staff reports and everything, Trump knows little to like bad shit about like foreign policy. Anything Definitely related to foreign policy. Specific yeah. names? No. He. I mean, I bet he can barely name his children. Besides, like this. I mean, like to be honest. So when it comes to um. So originally there was a missile strike that killed an American contractor that came from Iranian-backed militias in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, that killed an American contractor and injured, I believe, four uh, Iraqi soldiers. Mm -hmm. In response, we did a drone strike. Now, the options that were given to Trump were on like a big like sheet, and this, this was shown as a mid-rate option. And at that point, killing Soleimani was like from what I've read is the most extensive like far out there option. It was an sure. option that wasn't really wasn't like on the table. 
um like at it was there like he could have chose it but it wasn't something like he was being encouraged to take as far as i know mm -hmm. then well the um we might have different oh, fuck i have to go back and find the I, it might have been a new york times article but the I, the reading in there was that it's possible that people in his cabinet that are very hawkish on iran mm -hmm. was kind of pushing him in that direction to pick that to assassinate yeah. Soleimani he, as a target yeah but yeah that's true but it wasn't at this it was until after the embassy attack yeah yes yeah Correct. Different, it was a different point. So after this, mm -hmm. like nobody was saying, oh, okay, they just killed an American contractor. Let's kill Soleimani. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So after that point, there was the embassy attack, which Mute was organized, you know, probably most likely by the Quds Force. It was a lot of Iranian-backed militias, uh, PMF. Um, a lot of them. They went in there. They even wrote his name inside the embassy. Nobody died though, and that's crucial. That you know, no American was killed in the attack. Mm -hmm. That would have, if an American was killed, then it would have been in Benghazi for Trump. And a big part of the argument from a lot of people is that Trump was trying to avoid a Benghazi type situation. Sure. Because this is election season. Yep. Benghazi was disastrous for Hillary, even though let's be honest, it was kind of bullshit. Mm -hmm. And then um, to recap on that real quickly, uh, you can tell me if my understanding is incorrect. Benghazi was basically that the U.S. gets a lot of kind of sort of intel that a lot of embassies may be under attack at any single point in time. And then figuring out whether or not they're valid or not is a challenge in and of itself. There was mm -hmm. a heads up on Benghazi. We didn't take it as seriously as we probably should have. An attack happened. Americans were killed. And somehow Hillary, head of the State Department, literally gets saddled with 100% of the blame with that because of the Republicans. Yes. If, we, if, we were to find, if we were to say that Benghazi, that Hillary was at fault for Benghazi, then we'd have to say that George Bush was at fault for 9-11, which actually would be a more valid claim than Hillary was at fault from Giga, for sure. Benghazi. Or that literally, intelligence. yeah, or that every president or every secretary of state is responsible for every single embassy. It's, it's really stupid, yeah, of course. But okay. but I can un imagine after Hillary um, and, and Trump, after that election season, for an attack on an embassy to occur with Trump knowing that somebody like Soleimani is out there would probably look really, really bad for something like that, sure. Yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, I think that's one of the main reasons it was taken more seriously. And... Um, from what I know, this is another reason why I was taking more seriously. And this is the um, this I'll hit on this right now, because a lot of people I've actually saw like a discussion on like, yes, politics with like, I'm really important and Bastiat and a lot of other people mm -hmm. and like Tree of Logic was there. And there was a lot of bad takes on Iran from everybody involved. But I mean, that's that's, you know, it's Twitch. There's not a lot of foreign policy. Yeah, but there were some sure. people that was really good. I think IRI was good. Mm -hmm. Bastiat actually did pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Andre did. OK, a lot uh, of it is he, like the problem with this stuff is, um, do you know who Ryan Dawson is? <laughs> Ryan Dawson, isn't he the, the YouTuber? Um, yeah, he's like a, he's a very, very conspiracy lady. But I had a conversation with him once about Trump, and somehow it, it got into like Middle East shit, and I was like very out of my depth. Um, so I spent like literally like two weeks, like just information about the Middle East. A lot of this stuff is really hard to understand mm -hmm. by just reading like one or two things. Like you have to read a lot of stuff to start connecting the dots and to understand like the history of Iran and Iraq, the history of, you know, the Sh Shia Sunni divide, and why it's not even that simple because, you know, because you've got like, Sunni minorities ruling over Shia majority sometimes, like in yeah. Iraq or something. There's like there's a lot of shit. So yeah, the, the foreign so policy takes here are really complicated. Yeah, go okay, go for it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I would definitely like talk about how like on on Twitch. I think a lot of for instance, Tree of Logic had to take that like Iran won't fuck with us. We're America. We have a big ass military. But then I'd be like, well, actually, Iranian policy for the last twenty years has been to do has been asymmetrical to fuck warfare. Yes, yeah. has been actually literally fucking with has us been for the last killing American years. troops in Iraq. Has been helping 600. Assad in Syria. Like, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, you want to know how like how much they helped Assad? Like, it's it's insane. Like over fifty thousand fucking militiamen organized. Mm -hmm. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like that's yeah. like that's fucking with like like our interest to like get rid of Assad. And then of course, when it comes to like. Mm -hmm. Iraq, the 600 dead Americans. Yeah, the the LIA. explosive devices and stuff that were supplied by that that were too complicated for you know you know the guerrilla fighters in, in Iraq for ISIS or whatever to put together that were coming from Iran and everything too. Um, the mm -hmm. interest that they have with like Hezbollah um, over in Lebanon and stuff like yeah, there's like a lot of yeah yeah. Yeah, and then and then of course we can talk about like there's of course uh, in southern Lebanon there's Hezbollah which is directly mm -hmm. like supplied by them. We mm -hmm. could talk about the Houthi rebels which has been fucking with Saudi Arabia for a while. Mm -hmm. They have bombed Saudi Arabia like oil infrastructure which had made them have to cut it off by like cut their production for a short amount of time for about fifty percent. We could talk about like mines in the like in in, in the sea like the limpet mine attacks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We oh, with the drone like, strikes on the Saudi oil. Uh, yeah, that's what I talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this they've been fucking with us. So this it's, idea that like Iran real will not quick, fuck with us. It just it's very fucking annoying to me. I, like again, like I'm very clear that the U.S. is not a perfect fucking country, but it's really mm -hmm. irritating to me. And I, I, I don't even want to say this because I'm trying not to pay attention anymore. But all of the insane lefties online, they're like, stand for Iran. Like, Iran does no wrong. Iran is super chill. They haven't done anything wrong. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, come on, motherfuckers. Like, this is a yeah, very two sided uh, war. Like, America's no, the bigger I, I guy be, here. But, like, <laughs> okay, I want to be honest. And you have said this before. Yeah, go for this it. This is like a, this is an online thing. Like, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. Politics, okay. Mm -hmm. 
like the most far like the furthest you would go on this is probably bernie's take who was like this was assassination this was bad because it puts people at risk like mm -hmm. and that's like not that far out really that's sure. like very similar to my take to be completely honest yeah right? for sure so I i'm gonna be honest there's a lot of takes online and maybe it's because most of my career has been in real fucking politics and mm -hmm. not in this online shit even though i understand like because you know i'm a zoomer so this is like the stuff i work at yeah. and what i grew up in but I, I don't really pay much attention to that because it's just like fucking like th that's, that's it sucks that shit. it dominates online conversation when it's so detached from what people are talking about in the real world. Yeah, it's really irritating. But okay, yeah, sorry, that's, that's part of the reason why I actually started a Twitch channel. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, when it when it comes to that, like for instance, I saw this really bad take. Like, hey, did you know Iran does like uh, se allow sex change surgeries? Oh yeah, oh, <laughs> that's wait, because they no, force gay force people that. to yeah. convert. <laughs> They force it. They force it on gay people, and they were trying uh, to use it as they like the, they these extremely mm -hmm. woke, or or they'll just or they'll talk about how Soleimani fought ISIS. But I mean, literally everybody, everybody has fought. I I hate it when people say that. Yeah, dude, that guy fought ISIS. Literally every Turkey is fucking bombed ISIS. Russia is fucking bombed ISIS. The United States is fucking bombed ISIS. Assad is fucking probably gassed ISIS at some point. To be, like, fa <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, uh -huh. Turkey actually probably was the was one of ISIS's biggest allies in the region when they allowed ISIS fighters to move through and bought ISIS's oil. Well, yeah, that's so because they were literally getting cheap fucking oil from that country for a long time. Yeah. But I'm sure that when they moved south into Syria to prevent the PKK and the YPG from coming together, I'm sure they fucking bombed a few fucking ISIS installations to do that. Uh, they must actually, have. they used proxy ISIS fighters to actually invade northeastern Syria. Oh, well, fuck it up. Oh, never mind. Then I guess yeah, Turkey is... Yeah, uh, Turkey yeah, is okay, so, really so literally fun. everybody except for Turkey has fought ISIS and, then, so... And I want to be... Like, you should be careful about that, like, thing about PKK, YPG mm -hmm. coming together. Be very careful about that classification. Do you think Do you think that they wouldn't? I've heard a lot of, like, mixed opinions on that, like, back and forth on whether or not I, Turkey... I think I mean, if they maybe if they had complete freedom, they would. But mm -hmm. like the political pressure that was in place from Washington and Turkey, like the idea that they were going to come together in one organization is kind of weird. And not to mention the fact that, um, like they're two totally different like organizations. And like it, it would be like me trying to say like, hey, why aren't the Kurds in uh, in Iraq going to make a b mega big Kurdistan with the Kurds in Syria? Like, but do you they think have totally different ideological structures? They have totally different. For sure, uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely, I definitely understand that, and and I was aware of that before Turkey moved into Syria. But what is, I, but my understanding afterwards was that Turkey's that was one of the big reasons why Turkey moved into Syria was because they were trying to fuck over some of the Kurdish people. Is that not true, or what is your take on that? Or I mean, it, it is, it is the fuck over the Kurdish people. But mm -hmm. I mean, of course, they're going to be scared of like any like semblance of Kurdish independence because in in a free. Oh, Rojava, like if Rojava was its own thing, which America was pushing for, but the people within it, like, actually wanted to have, like, a kind of, like, semi-independent region within the Syrian government. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, so that actually one of the main reasons we screwed them, because if they were allowed to make an agreement with the Syrian government earlier, mm -hmm. um, then they wouldn't have to deal with, like, all the concessions they're going to have to give the Syrian government now. But mm -hmm. um, when, it, when it comes to that, like, as... If they were ever free, they'd of course be like, "Hey, the Kurds in uh, in T Turkey should probably be free too." And of course, that would be bad for uh, Erdogan, who's like a who's a ultra nationalist type. And I would also say part of the reason Erdogan is going to invade northeastern Syria is because his economic policy has failed miserably. And and just like Putin, when when you have really bad domestic policy, when Putin had to raise the um, retirement Shore age, it up with you have to foreign go... policy bullshit. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. P Putin's ide ideology has always just been based in stability, like. Uh, when it comes to, for instance, he praises the Soviet Union, but he doesn't praise like Marxist-Leninism. He's not a Marxist-Leninist. Mm -hmm. He just cares about stability. That's his ideology. Okay. Um. So anyway, we go back to um. Yeah. Yeah. So Soleimani's done a lot of horrible, horrible things when it comes to, comes up to war, and I, I don't mm -hmm. want to see anybody like praising him. I'll anyway. praise him. He seemed like an insane fucking dude. That guy could get shit done. It seems oh, like well, he expanded the Quds force to like uh, like his he had his hands in so many different things. Maybe admirable, but not like uh not a good. I wouldn't call him a good guy, of course. But um, man, well, that yeah, guy. Like Goebbels is very good at making propaganda, right? Sure. But that doesn't mean like I I'm gonna stand Goebbels. But it seemed I mean? like my impression of Soleimani is that this guy is playing like three sides of like any given conflict at any point in time. Like during the uh, like the U.S. intervention in Iraq, like there are times where he's helping U.S soldiers there's times where he's killing u.s soldiers there are times where it, like it seemed insane the reach that this guy had and the influence that he had across like the entire like that syria iraq and iran region and then over in lebanon as well over hezbollah like it seemed like really crazy well yeah i mean uh, if anything i would actually say it, it's one of the few organizations of the world and what he's been able to do mm -hmm. um has is probably one of the few organizations that is actually able to kind of match american like influence and able to like play sides against each other and do stuff like that when it comes sure. to like all, and it. all while doing it while his country is economically fucked by sanctions yeah, too. Yeah. So it's not Did even you know, like he you know. just uh, the bill that was just passed that designated the U.S. military terrorist organization in Iran mm -hmm. also just gave uh, the Quds Force uh, two hundred twenty-four million more dollars, which doesn't seem like a lot from an American's 
perspective. Mm -hmm. But that is a decent amount of money uh, when it comes to like funding a specific branch of the Revolutionary yeah. Guard. Yeah, yeah. And my my understanding of it is that Soleimani was actually able to get um, it's something like two million or two hundred thousand barrels of oil a day. Like the profits from that are always set aside for his branch, so they can always operate kind of with impunity. They don't have to worry about if the economy is doing good or bad. They don't have to worry about the population or whatever. That like he always had like a specific funding available to him. That that guy commanded like so much respect from the Iranian government. Yeah. Not now. Let's 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 um to be killer to everybody. The Iranian Revolutionary Guard, like that shit, is one of the most important institutions within Iran. Like mm -hmm. like when it comes to not only as a military institution but a political institution because they protect the revolution, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it would be like saying it's. I mean, I would even go further when it comes to its influence in politics and like something like the KGB would be in like the Soviet Union. Like this is something that if you don't have the support of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard when you're in office, you're probably not going to be in office very long. Sure. And then he also had deep, deep, deep ties. To, um, he was actually flouted as flouted somebody who might just be in charge of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard at some point. Mm -hmm. And he also had he was had a very decent like good relationship with the supreme leader as well, who recently sobbed at his funeral. Yeah. Uh, which so I mean like so this person again like and killing this person would have of course like piss off Iran tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say like he he already had like a cult following when it came in when it came to Iran. I would say he had like the household name recognition of someone like Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Like this was somebody who was known by everybody in the country. This wasn't just some like like Americans. We don't really know who our generals are. Like, Until I was, they like, fuck up listening. and we hear about like General exactly. Petraeus or Mattis or whatever. Yeah, exactly. But even Mattis doesn't have like the same name recognition as someone like Hillary Clinton, right? Mm -hmm. Like Hillary Clinton, like you see a picture of Hillary Clinton, you know who they are. That's the type of like level of like recognition like he had in that society, right? Yeah. Okay, so um. Also, thank everybody for the Twitch Prime subs. I, I didn't expect this on the first day I got affiliate. Anyway, um, so when it when it comes to that, so you understand like how influential this guy was. Yeah, so killing this yeah. guy, how much is, of an impact it's going to have. Yeah, okay. for sure. So he gets murked, but he's not the only person who's murked either. There's also six other people, one of which is, a, is the chief, deputy chief of the PMF. You know who the PMF are? One, four, uh, no, two, Remy. seven. The popular mobilization forces within Iraq. It's okay. He was an official Iraqi military official. He was he was in the Iraqi military. Okay. So we killed him. Now technically that that now that militia that he was a part of is allied very closely with Iran, right? A lot mm -hmm. of a lot of parts of it are very obviously allied very closely with Iran. Now, but the fact is that this is part of the Iraqi military. So we just killed an Iraqi official mm -hmm. and a Iranian official in the same strike. And that's why uh, Iraq has recently voted to expel all U.S. troops. Was that Iraq. was that? So I know that there was it's a non-binding. It's non-binding, so they're not. It's not, yeah. nothing's really going to come of it. But okay. it that... shows general interest of like Iraqis being like, get the fuck out of our country. Sure. Right. The only people that I saw, the only political forces within Iraq, I had to actually call up a few people, were that the Kurds didn't show up to the vote and that the Sunnis didn't show up to the vote. But it's a Shiite, Shiite majority country. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that means the majority of people, you know did vote for the ex exploit like get kicking out american troops yeah which of course is, is a damage to u.s interest but i don't personally i don't always just say like what serves best u.s interest i yeah. do mostly humanitarian work sure right? yeah i the looking at it from the interest is just is interesting because i like, get it, it feels like that's what you have to do to win yeah but <laughs> um, like I given actually... 10 countries nine focusing on humanitarian interests and one focusing on its own interest the one that puts its own interest first will always come out like on top w without like some like captain planet unifying force or some fantastical um shit. i would say that i there is an argument now i personally well i would say like i'm, I'm a pussy hippie right and that's mm -hmm. what i do why i do what i do like i believe in the united nations and shit like that i stand them all the time but um, there is an argument from a realist perspective for like being a good humanitarian for the fact of just like optics and like keeping your allies to support you because you know for instance right like the killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi for instance was a huge Saudi, uh, yeah. realist like loss for Saudi Arabia not because it, like you know they there was like some military failure but because everybody was like oh that's really horrible you did that we're not gonna invest in your oil launch your nationalization. Uh, you you going public with your nationalized oil company. Yep, screw that. Mm -hmm. And that, like, hurt them economically. So there is, like, a realist perspective to, like, make an argument for, for stuff like that. Sure. But... But personally, I'm I'm not a realist. I'm not a, I'm not a Henry Kissinger type of Yeah, I guess, like, the thing that hurts is that, like, so much political capital and human capital was expended on, on turning Iraq into almost like a Japan 2.0, where it's like, all right, we moved in, we fucked the country up, but we're going to stay here for like 10 fucking years, kind of sort of trying to help the new government, keeping everything stable. And then when we pull out, hopefully it's like still like a U.S. friend, you know, because we deposed Saddam, who was a U.S. ally, but now we got a new guy. Hopefully he's like a better one and doesn't do all the same fucky shit. And then to just watch all of that just like disappear, like year, like a few years now, after like exiting, like, holy Holy fuck, what a waste of everything. Like, God now, I damn. don't know. I mean, like, have you read the Afghanistan papers by any chance? Nope. 
What about him? Okay. Um, I would highly, highly, highly suggest in reading the... I have actually read all 2000 because I'm insane. But uh, just reading the Washington Post article should be enough. It shows uh, the complete failure of the Afghanistan war. And it shows not only that we, of course, it failed for the reasons we all know, guerrilla warfare, all that stuff, um, you know, mm -hmm. us, like, isolating the population from us. But that our military leaders didn't know who we're fighting. Sure. Um, they didn't know who our allies were in the region. Henry Kissinger specifically said, I don't even know who's our enemies when we're going in this country. Mm -hmm. Talking about Pakistan and Osama bin Laden was eventually killed in Pakistan. Many of the same fundamental issues we have in Afghanistan, the same ones we've always faced in Iraq when it came to, like, what's the goal? Why are we here? Was it here just to uh, get rid of Saddam? Are we going to install democracy? Or was it just weapons of mass destruction? Yeah. How long are we going to stay here? What What's uh, rules of engagement? What's, there was a lot of, like, uh, like just How heads bumping against each other, and that's one of the bucks. main reasons we're still there, and we haven't really be able, been able to find a conclusion. But th in any in, in any like conflict we're in, in, like when it comes to Iraq, th that's going to be definitely when you're in an administration like George Bush, where George Bush was definitely not the like the main puller, like the main person, like pushing the forces, right? Um, yeah. And that's one of the I, I could go into a really long argument, but that's a totally different conversation. I'd be willing to have with you a different day. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be really interesting if you were to go through the Afghanistan papers. It's probably the, one of the most important leaks, since the, uh, not leaks, but document like dump since the Pentagon papers, in my opinion. Sure. OK, I'll, I'll at least okay. read the WAPO article on that later today then. Yeah. OK, cool. So, OK, so where were we when it came to actually like what happened? So, OK. Yeah. We, so, we, yeah. Was it good or was it bad? Okay, so we kill them, everything okay. In my opinion, I think it was a bad uh, moral move for putting people at risk, and bad strategically. I think it was bad in both aspects. Okay, uh, more than that, interested in, so strategically, um, hit me up with that, I'm curious. And then okay. I'll give what I think would be the U.S. counter-arguments, go. Okay, so when it comes to um, the idea that we have been completely capped his ability to do shit, mm -hmm. um, his deputy chief who has taken his position is an extremely competent official, and um, I, I, I have high doubts that he will not be able to perform at least to 90% of the ability that uh, uh, the person who's currently in there. And I don't know who, if you know much about the person who took his spot. Um, I don't know anything about him yet, but my impression, um, my impression reading about him was that this guy was like a one-off that like you can't get another Soleimani. Now the other guy well, that comes up could be competent in his own way or whatever, yes. but that killing him does represent like some, yes. yeah. Yeah, it does. It does represent a strategic loss, but I do not believe the strategic loss is, is comparable to the risk we've just put to American interests in the region and who we just isolated from us. And the fact that the person who's taking his place is also pretty comparable. If we had someone like like if we had like some like just like political appointment, like make the position, maybe you can make the argument that the amount of deaths overall from long term would would actually be different in, in U.S. interest, but I don't think that's mm -hmm. the case. This person do you think there's a this... do you think there's a possibility? Because this is what the I think this is what the State Department said, but they didn't give any official releases. That do you think there's a possibility that he might have been actively planning more embassy attacks right now? Because I think the okay. State Department said this that like is he was the most on interesting. Yeah. This is the most interesting thing because when I was watching like the polit yes politics stream, somebody I think it was um I forget it's like LTC it was like. Uh, like logic i forgot any tree logic and another person just mm -hmm. the two trump two trumples anyway oh uh, lecture about. fan yeah both of these lecture guys fan. are trump like, like sick offense like, or whatever but, yeah. yeah lecture fan specifically was like well we won't really know the information of the strategic but they said there was going to be a uh, attack and there was evidence so well actually the ev evidence is currently public do you know do you know this doesn't um, no, because my understanding was that they didn't give a comment officially on what they had, but go for it. So this is, this is the information I've heard from Washington Post reporters and everybody else. Maybe they have wrong information, but I, I, I highly like respect the Washington Post. I know there's some people who like don't trust them, like fake news media, but I mm -hmm. do respect most Washington Post, uh, you know, yeah. workers. I know many personally, I work for some anyway, when it, when it comes to, um, what, this is the three pieces of overall evidence. Now, there's some tiny details that, of course, was was left out. But this is what I've heard. That number one was that uh, Soleimani was doing a lot of mo was moving a lot in Syria and Lebanon as of late. And those movements were in strategic positions that apparently were counter to U.S. interests, uh -huh. which means he was probably, you know, with uh, Hezbollah and southern Lebanon. They didn't give specifics, but that's my what I think that probably means when it comes to Syria it's probably something with Bashar al-Assad, maybe with militias. Uh -huh. Um counted the U.S. interest in the region because, you know, Sir Bashar al-Assad is tied with Russia and yeah. also Iran. Sure. Okay. Uh, there was that. The second piece of evidence was that um, he, 
got apparently like some message from Iran asking him to come back for a large operation. There was no like explanation of what the large operation was or if it had anything to do with the United States. It could be weapon shipments to Hezbollah. It could be something in Bahrain, maybe expanding influence in Bahrain. I don't know much about Bahrain, so I can't go too much into that. Okay. Uh, it could be something with the Houthi rebels. It, it could be a lot of different things, but it was nothing specific, right? And the last thing was, and I'm going to be honest, it really sounded basically, if I was to like t translate into Zoomer talk, they haven't been vibing with us recently. That, and when it comes in, specifically Iraq, they have been doing a lot of actions like with it, when it comes to the embassy attack, uh, the missile strike, mm -hmm. and other things, and, and digging their claws into uh, Iraq, which you can see through the Iran cables. Mm -hmm. They have been you know, opposed to us strategically, at least to an extent. My, so, let, I, so I'm curious for my background here, and then you can tell me this right around my impression. My feeling about Iraq was that the U.S. pullout of Iraq, as painful as it is to say, was probably too early, and that when we left that country, it was more a political decision than a military strategic one. That we kind of abandoned them, let them get fucked, basically, and that their leadership, not the, I don't, not Maliki, but the guy that came afterwards, like expressed like regret that. I wish I could have gotten more help from the United States. Like I'm feel pretty fucked here. Like that that was my impression that Iraq felt pretty fucked that when we left. Even though I know people had said that there were like people cheering or whatever, but from a strategic point of view, their leadership felt pretty fucked when we exited that country. I, I would say that the most of the roots that come from like mm -hmm. um us being there, actually I would say it has to do with the initial invasion. And I would actually put the roots there. Um sure. this isn't talked a lot about most of the people say the military operation was a complete success. But anytime we would like go through a city, for instance, uh, there was massive looting. We didn't like have like specialists. You know how like when you, when you take a city, people don't really think about like okay, now who's going to be the bank teller now that American forces have gone through? Who's going to be that? And society come like downfall. And that not and how we dealt with the Baath party members was abysmal when it came to like what we're going to do with them. Banning after. every single person from taking government again was a fucking nightmare. Yeah, yeah because so that stupid. means you get rid of basically every like competent yep. government official, even yeah. if they're like serving us uh, like you know a horrible fucking dictator. You still need somebody to run the country. Yeah. And then the last thing we did is that. We just like the Iraqi military is bye bye. Like that was that really the smartest decision since we only fought like fifteen percent of the Iraqi military and the other eighty five percent literally was almost like completely deserted. And mm -hmm. then those young men who only know how to fight don't have a job because everything collapsed and then yeah. insurgency. And then we I needed, heard like the military that came after was so rife with corruption. They were there's a name for this, I don't remember, but like ghost soldiers that they were like oh, tens yes, of this, thousands of people on the payroll that like, didn't even exist. The, Afghanistan papers. Yeah. the same thing happened in Afghanistan. Oh that, geez, okay, yeah. That they would that these commanders would just write in stuff like and, say we oh yeah we have twenty thousand soldiers they only yeah. have like five hundred and mm -hmm. then he would just pocket the rest of the money and that was not only was that bad because you know fucking corruption but also it was horrible due to the fact that um when ISIS came through we were like well that city has like ten thousand fighters they could hold off and they got like two people like yeah and that's why like, they just pieced cards. out and ran away when ISIS came up they're like see ya yeah. Exactly, yep. exactly. And then we so, also like, set the stage in that country to some extent for the Shia majority to get revenge on the Sunnis that were ruling over them before. And basically by banning all the Ba'ath people, by banning all the... Because the Ba'ath was largely like kind of Sunni aligned, right? Even though it was, it said it was a secular party. I think that was like a Sunni aligned party, no? Yeah, it was Sunnis ruling mm -hmm. the country. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it kind of set the stage for the, for the counter oppression, I guess, to come up now that they were able to get their comeuppance against them. Yeah. Oh, thanks for just prime. But anyway, um, when it comes to um, this specifically, like, there's a lot of dictators in the region. Like, we're a secular Ba'ath party. We believe in secularism. Like, we don't force all the women to wear veils. But if they don't have good relations with, like, local tribes or warlords, like, they're not going to be able to hold power. So anybody who says that, mm -hmm. they're, that they're secular in their entirety is, is lying to you. Sure. Um. Anyway, so when it comes to that, so what's probably going to happen, and my main reason I'm, I'm against this attack is the response, and also the fact that we killed a member of the Iraqi military, which further isolates us from, from the people of Iraq and the parliament. Which if we don't if we don't have a good Hello working relationship Israel. with the government Indeed. of Iraq, it's gonna be very hard for us to ever like stabilize the country or to even use it as like an effective foothold against Iran, right? Yeah. Or and so. and more importantly, even to keep um Iran and Syria somewhat separated as well, which represents a threat to US interests in the region too, yeah. Or or yeah. just a general strengthening of Iran, which we've been trying to fuck for so long, which Saudi Arabia is constantly getting into fights with that fucking hates and like, yeah. And then and yep. then probably by that proxy as well, the strengthening of like Hezbollah Do you and whatnot in crazy? Lebanon. Yeah. What? Something crazy. Saudi Arabia, which is one of the most anti Iran countries in the world, sure. actually was like, Trump, please de escalate this, please. This is going fucking insane. Don't do this. Mm -hmm. And they they've been one of the countries that's constantly been prodding to war. I don't know if that's because they've been like slapped majorly in uh when it comes to yemen and now they're like packing up like okay maybe maybe this was a bad idea um but the only country that we actually told beforehand was israel and they're the only country right now that's like yeah let's keep this going let's keep going but of course because israel has always yeah because israel wants us to do whatever we can to f i think israel almost wants a 
full on like fucking war with Iran. I would say get... secretly, definitely yeah. Netanyahu wants a full on because, war. Because um, if... well, yeah, because Netanyahu was one of the guys that was like w- w- was like saying like, oh, by the way, we have proof that Iran is still working on nukes, even though we can't show anybody any of it, and yeah, we don't actually yeah. have any proof. Yeah. yeah, can we talk for a second? How okay? Now we can say that. I would say another reason why this is horrible is now the Iran deal is completely dead. Um, it's sure. completely thrown out now. That's another thing. Like, it, the Iran deal should have kept going. Yeah, the Iran, for, the, Iran, the Iran deal was not only politically masterful from an American perspective, being able to actually get that through, but from an Iranian perspective, it was almost like, like the work of God that they were actually able to do that with the conservatives in that country not wanting to make that deal. Mm-hmm. Um, it honestly, I don't know if we could ever get another deal like the Iran deal. It was probably one of the best deals, like. Like yeah, I was saying for a long history. time that I thought that was going to be like a like a hallmark, like a lasting impression of Obama's legacy that he exactly. that we were actually able exactly. to work I'm out. I'm not a huge Obama stand, but that mm-hmm. personally, like, like, completely gives us like it would make like a C presidency to like a B presidency. You know, like it completely sure. changes like the map when it comes to foreign policy. Yeah. Now, a lot of Americans don't really look at foreign policy that much, which is why I'm trying. You know, I'm doing all this shit, but. Um, but to me, it, me- it meant a lot. And to anybody who was, like, paying attention to the world of Fios, that meant to yeah, me a lot. Yeah, holy shit. Yeah, the idea of normalizing relations with a country that we are, like, permanently, like, destroying with sanctions and would, like... Oof, yeah, like, n- not to mention that there were times in our past where even, like, with even negotiating with Soleimani, where there were times where we could have, where we came so close to, like, being okay with each other, to, ha- to like, somewhat, not normalizing relations, but get to getting to, like, an area where we didn't fucking hate each other. Uh, and I mean, like, it's a younger generation in Iran. A lot of them don't remember the coup from, like, the, oh. from 52 and everything. Like, <laughs> it's yeah, possible. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> People, because, like, that's the thing. People like Triologic and, and the rest of them. While I, I don't like to insult anybody because I'm a hippie, mm-hmm. but when it, when it comes to, like, I doubt they really know, like, the history of, like, Muhammad Mossadegh and like the really like far back or when we shot down an Iranian like civilian plane. Oh yeah, we just killed them all like sorry. Didn't we give him yeah, like ten then, million oh, dollars or way, something? And then George Bush, the vice president at the time, was literally like, I will not apologize. Like just like he we just murked like two hundred and ninety people and we wouldn't even yeah. apologize for it. And like even though we can give them money, like money's not gonna be like, can you imagine like being a family and then being told shooting like, down? Yeah. We won't apologize while we stuff money into the pocket. That's like, actually that's not thick relations. One of the craziest things about foreign politics that I never understood is I can't believe we can like civilian airliners get shot down and like nobody cares. Um, because that happened over was it over Crimea as well? Where uh, I, I, can, I can explain why. Um, when, th- those are usually used as political chips by like uh, demagogues because this usually happens in countries where there's like a lot of tension and usually countries where there's a lot of tension between like borders and stuff there's usually a demagogue on like either side mm-hmm. right so the demagogue will use that as like a political chip but at the end of the day that's not strategic interest we didn't like destroy like a tank or something of that sort we didn't just challenge a military interest we just it's it, all at the end of the day it just becomes propaganda uh, even though, like, personally, I care it's immensely about the human loss of life. Also, Basia just asked me a question. Uh, we produce enough oil to sustain ourselves and have built a national security apparatus to stop terrorism. Why are we in the Middle East anymore? Um, a lot of the reason, uh, there's a few reasons. Again, like, these different people have a lot of ideas why we should still be in the Middle East. John Bolton, for instance, wants to, like, merc uh, Iran to secure U.S. interests in the region because of how many proxy wars are fighting. Yeah, the pro- but, uh, my understanding but, of the biggest reason we're in the Middle East is because we have two very important allies in that region of the world. Right? That, Israel, well, yeah, you're, you're yeah, right, you're right Israel on Israel and right the Gulf states, like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, or whatever, and that a unify and like, these are, like, Saudi Arabia is constantly funding, like, Sunni extremists, like, all over that fucking region, like, um, and, and the idea yeah. of allowing those three states, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, to completely unify under common interest while serving the interests of Russia rather than the United States is completely juxtaposed to the mission that we have there in defending the allies of Israel and the yeah. Gulf states. Yeah. Which, again, and makes the Iran deal even look that much more impressive. Doesn't yeah, it? holy if we could have shit! Escalated that region. I can't when, believe when we. Had- we- I mean, I think because to be that fair, would have undercut Putin too. Yeah. That would have completely undercut Putin. For that would have sure. undercut so much instability. And not to mention, like uh, uh, the main argument I heard, and I had a debate with the neoconservative about this recently on Bastiat's mm-hmm. channel, is that. Well, if we do this Iran deal, what about all the proxy conflicts they're fighting? Are we just going to ignore that? Well, no. You see that as like a step in the in the room, and then you go from that point mm-hmm. because you can't put that much stuff on an already incredibly complicated deal. Like you're going to be like, what? You want to pay? Okay, Bahrain, uh, Yemen, Houthis, uh, Hezbollah, Lebanon, uh, the state of Israel, and Palestine. Like Israel, Palestine. That's the whole, whole entire like it's agreement. Like we're going to mm-hmm. resolve that and all in one agreement. Do you know how insane yeah, of course. that is? Yeah, and not to draw like like try to do big on like the history counterfactuals. Like oh well, if this if the Iran deal would have gone through, 100 percent everything would have been okay like there still would have been problems there still would have been things like i'm sure the gulf states wouldn't have been happy with it i'm sure that saudi arabia still would have tried to fuck with it of course but like it, i think it was definitely a step in the right direction like an, 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 oh, fuck. immensely yeah immensely. Holy shit. it was an amazing step in the right direction mm-hmm. now now we're probably we're getting a little off track so let's yeah, go sorry, back to yeah, why, yeah, yeah. why i think this is bad now number one of course we isolating our allies in the region not only in, in specifically in the region but around the world like everybody around the world we are really the only country who like wanted this happen except for israel 
right? Wanted so, what, the assassination of yeah, Suleiman. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, when it comes to well, everybody wanted him dead, but it's just like that's not how you do it. He's a foreign government official. Yeah. Like everybody, I mean, like I, I would assume like a lot of people want Putin dead. A lot of people want Kim Jong Un. This is another thing. A lot of people are saying like, look at all the horrible things he did, and judging it by that, like the loss of life, the tremendous loss of life, and that's why we should kill him. Well, there's a lot of people in the world <laughs> who like, are responsible like, for a lot of dead people. Like yeah. Kim Jong Un is the leader of a slave state, a mm -hmm. literal slave state, where he's he's enslaved huge parts of his population to keep his dictator his like family dictatorship alive. And he's constantly making threats to literally genocide the southern part of his border. Mm -hmm. And we don't kill him. Does or, mean... you know, there was also a really popular leader in the Middle East that uh, was responsible for gassing a large population of people. We literally went into his country to make him fuck off, and we still kept him there. Saddam Hussein, yeah. somebody might these remember people, him. Like, these people, if, and we if didn't even kill that guy. Somebody, you're going to have to make a similar argument for instance, for, like in Iraq. Yeah, holy shit, yeah. But so when it comes to killing Somali, like— look, look, like I, I think it's wrong for for that reason. Like mm -hmm. you don't just kill him just because. Not in the way that him. it was done. If we could have caught him, like it sounds dirty, but if we could have caught him like in Syria or some shit on a battlefield and paid off, so like some FSA dude or some shit to kill him, or or caught him like, like somewhere like there, maybe. But yeah, like, like in like, Baghdad like, airport. The thing like, is, that's the thing. Like we ignore. Like there's like a huge like geopolitical thing that people talk about. Now personally, again, I. I'm arguing this mostly from a strategic position right now. Like, I could talk, I could, like, for 20 minutes, I could lecture you on, like, what it means to kill another human being. Yeah. But that's just me being a hippie. Sure. Um, when it when it comes to um strategically, like, we completely threw off, like, the veil of proxy conflict with this proxy under this thing, like, that we can kind of do with plausible deniability. We just threw it out the window. It was like, we kill him directly. We kill an Iraqi military member. We're gonna, and, and if you do anything in response, we'll commit war crimes. Like, do you know how crazy that is when we said we were going to, we were going to bomb cultural sites within Iran? And now the Pentagon, um, his U.S. security, his national security advisor, his uh, Mike Pompeo, his his press secretary have all like distanced himself from that statement because Trump literally advocated for the use of war crimes against Iran and how horrible that looks on the world stage and how horrible that would be if we actually target Iranian cultural sites. Mm -hmm. Like this has become a huge, massive blunder, not only for optics but of course the strategic reasons for for, for those optics. Like do you, you you do realize like he just threatened war crimes? Recently. Well, yeah, that's basically terrorism. <laughs> like it's what yes, he did. Like exactly. the idea of like inciting like terror in a population by targeting civilian disease. That's no, I'm sorry. That's not basic. That is terrorism. Like yes, literally exactly. by definition. That is terrorism. Yeah. That is a, not only is that a war crime under the U S war crimes mm -hmm. act, that's a war crime by international law. And that's a war crime by literally any post possible standard you can put it to. Also something very interesting from a strategic point of view. I don't know if this matters or not, but now I'm, now I'm super curious if Iran did do something to the U S the pressure is on that much more for a U.S. response because our president that's has literally walked out publicly. That is why I'm terrified. Yeah. And said so like, yo, Oh, we're gonna fuck you like, up. Yeah. That tweet made everything like temp like at this point, like before it, I was like, okay, we're like a 30, 30 to 70 chance before war. Like after he said that, mm -hmm. me knowing that an Iranian sponsor is inevitable, in my mm -hmm. opinion, and that's my opinion. You can ask me why, but inevitable. Yeah. Now it's like 40 60. Sure. Like we are like at the brink of like literally flipping a coin if we go to war with Iran or not. Like One, that's really fucking scary to me. So here's something that I've been thinking about a lot recently on stream as we talk about things like democracy. Um, I wonder if this influences other countries' uh, opinions to go to war with the United States. One thing that sucks about democracy is that our leaders have to remain popular. It feels like any type of prolonged foreign warfare is always going to result in a democratic shift in the United States into new leadership, which makes it impossible for us to sustain any type of like Long. So like Destiny. I feel like Iran has to know that, right? It. Yeah. Destiny, not like, only have you got it, but this is something I had again, I've debated like with neocons all the time. Mm -hmm. That when they go in the war, they don't really care about like war fatigue. That's yeah. not something they really consider. Yeah, they don't have to. They're not trying to win elections, but we're trying to win an election at home and conduct like a foreign like military offensive. That's really fucking hard to do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Not only is it terrifying so let's think. We've been through Iraq, which has been a massive military catastrophe. Yeah. We've been through And Afghanistan, political catastrophe, military and political catastrophe. Military yeah. and political catastrophe. Did you know that we uh, the, the Afghanistan papers go through this we've spent more trying to rebuild afghanistan than we did rebuilding the entirety of europe after world war ii and counted for inflation nice. like it, it's like it's 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 insane we've spent and i've talked about this from like this was came from aid workers in the area that government officials would get three million dollars a day for something in afghanistan the size of a u.s county right nice. and they would look around them and there'd literally be huts everywhere and they're like what am i supposed to throw this money at and so it would just all we would build is like a kleptocracy 90 percent of that money be wasted so it's we've completely like failed in afghanistan when it, when it comes to like like that or we could talk my, about the drug war yeah my understanding 86... for afghanistan real quick and then you can tell me if you do, my understanding for afghanistan right now is that if we were to pull out kabul would fall to the taliban like the next day 
Like that's why making an agreement with the Taliban is so important. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, people like go after me, like, "Oh my God, you love terrorism? Are you like the Taliban's number one fan now?" Like, mm-hmm. no, I don't love terrorism. It's just you have to negotiate with your enemies if you're gonna get anything here. Yeah, there's no way in hell we could leave mm-hmm. with also having like a hostile uh, arrangement with the Taliban mm-hmm. and not like see like the fall of Kabul. Like, I do not see that possible. They have more land right now than they ever have like ever. Like it's it's ever since the start of the war. Like mm-hmm. I don't I don't see it as as strategically possible. And that's the one thing I'm happy Trump's doing, even though he botched it up midway through because he didn't want to negotiate with the Taliban on July fourth. Nice. Because he's he's that's just how he rolls. But when it when it comes to this now, um, so of course we isolated our allies. When it comes to strategic uh, reasons, um, we've isolated our allies abroad as well, not only in the region. When it comes to killing, uh. We've also undercut the Iranian protests. Have you been following the Iranian protests? Um, I have not. All I ever hear is that a bunch of people try to protest and they basically just get killed so, immediately. <laughs> but- Ari Fletcher, who is some Fox News contributor, went on went on the show and you know Fox News some good takes on there. He decided to say that <laughs> yeah. because we killed Soleimani and because these protests were going on, now all of Iran's going to celebrate that we killed Soleimani, which is not only the uh... dumbest take I've ever heard in my entire life, but it shows a complete like this lack of knowledge in who Soleimani was, and further proves that nobody even knew who Soleimani money was before this and that's another thing if you're going to kill someone and make it this high risk of a situation Mm -hmm. at least make sure that the population knows like the severity of the decision you made or who this guy was right yeah maybe yeah (laughs) like if we just well it seems like (laughs) what you said earlier was actually i think really correct i think that the average american if they could rank like 10 issues that were important to them i think foreign policy would go at the very bottom yeah and that pisses mm -hmm. me off immensely because well because this is a global war war and like foreign policy affects everything in your life and people don't even realize it it. does but like agreements is so important it's impossible to for an average person to get on any foothold and what the fuck is going on like everything is so complicated and things are sold in such an easy way like why did we invade iraq to go to saddam well because saddam was a bad guy like it's so much more complicated than that and, and that's true of yeah. like everything in the region you know like like everybody uh, like, there's a lot of bad people in the world like donald trump's a bad guy but like i mean like, yeah i mean of, like, like depending on who you ask like if you go to people in yemen fuck who was the one there was like a there was a guy who was interviewed whose sister was like killed by a drone strike and then i think he was killed by like his sister died to a drone strike under obama and then he died to a drone strike under trump or something in yemen like, like crazy there are families shit. generational who have had their families killed by every single president for the last multi decade. yeah like, multi-generations yeah. of like yeah of you U.S. And either funded or like the fucking U.S. is written on the fucking missile, like kills like their family members, like Jesus. Yeah. Destiny. Do you hate freedom? We're bringing freedom to them. Though. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, we're Raytheon freeing them from the freedom. from this dimension. I guess. Jesus. Raytheon sponsored freedom, my guy. Yeah. But when, when when it comes when when it comes to of course now we've undercut the protests in Iran. Now Trump has constantly talked about like the people of Iran need to rise up. Which number one, that's a dumb thing to like. You don't just say that. Because then they can use that and say, hey, this is a U.S.-sponsored coup, yeah. and then they can kill all the protesters. Mm-hmm. So, like, when, when this type of stuff goes on, you can just be like, um, you know, we support people's right to protest. And that's all you should really say, really. You can't, like, go much further than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if you get too involved, then it's going to give them, like, an, abil- an easier chance to, like, kill all the protesters. Yeah. But what he did has completely undercut the, like, hundreds of people who have been killed in Iran recently protesting against the government because mm-hmm. of fuel subsidy cuts. And they were saying, no joke. Why? And this is literally this is the same shit you hear all the time in American politics. Why are we doing all this stuff in Iraq? Why are we doing all this stuff in Syria? Why are we doing all this stuff in Lebanon? Why are we doing all this stuff in Yemen when our own people are starving and hungry on the street and you're cutting our fuel subsidies? That should be invested at home. Yeah. We, it's literally the same thing you hear here. Mm-hmm. Like Iran, when you come to like Iranian populations and and Iran, they the complaints you see in American like uh, the American working class basically, if we want to get into that, mm-hmm. um, is very similar to what you see in like. Iran and the Iranian working class like they'll sure. say basically the same shit when it comes to their foreign policy just mm-hmm. like fuck them get out of it I'm sick of losing our sons and daughters of this shit mm-hmm. I'm sick of wasting all of our money overseas when we could be like pay for healthcare at yeah home. and people forget like s- sanctions do damage like the people Extreme of Iran damage. feel those fucking sanctions it's not just know a fucking meme on Iraq if they actually make our troops leaves we will be no, that Trump said if they if they make our troops leave. Oh, we would sanction them. Oh, sure, yeah. That would, I, damn, which what does that. that make it sound like we're doing? This sound makes it sound like an occupation, doesn't it? Uh, oh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, if we're like, if you hey, if you don't accept our troops, oh, you voted for our troops to leave. Well, you mm-hmm. better not make us leave because if we're due, you feel severe consequences. Yeah. So we're helping you. Like yeah, that a lot of 
A lot of people blame that the nineteen the nineteen fifty two coup in in Iran one hundred percent in America as well. Um, that that government that was going be to be overthrown. Be, be America it'd be UK. It'd be, it, it's yeah, yes, it thank happen. you. Yes, it would be because the UK begged us to fucking bail out their shitty yeah. fucking oil company because they were too fucking stupid to to make a deal with Iran on anything really. Yeah. But regardless of that, that government was already collapsing. That like that government was going to be overthrown because the people were mad as fuck over economic turmoil because the oil was fucking expensive in that country because economically that country was fucked and nobody was happy there. Like that country was on its way to revolution. Now we wanted to put in our guy, but like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, economic pressure is is a real fucking thing, like, and it causes people, you know, yeah, to respond Bastia in various ways. Yeah. Recently, actually talked about this, and he talked about it, like, indeed, like, I think I actually got angry at it. He said that sometimes uh, sanctions can actually be a lot worse than war. Yeah, of course. Sanctions over a long period oh. of time can actually people. And I agree. Who with did that he thing. talk to? Somebody. It... He was talking. It was. It was. It was. Um. What's his name? He's a uh, young Turks, very handsome. Um, was it? Was it Hassan? Yeah, Hassan. Oh, yeah, and Hassan was like, wait, so you're going to tell me that sanctions are can be worse than bombing a country? Yeah, of course. What the well, fuck? They, they, uh. I would say in the majority of cases, that's not that's not. Yeah, true. in the but majority of cases, it's probably not let, true. Let's but like, say like we did that when it came to Yugoslavia or when it came to the Rwandan genocide. Like, no, like that. And those are two cases that sanctions would have just made the situation immensely worse. Sure, of course. But like in other uh, but, cases, like in the case with Iran, sanctions are incredibly fucking powerful and have been destroying that country's economy, like absolutely devastating that country's economy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Completely. Now, let's be fair. The masses of people aren't dying. Like a war with Iran would obviously be a lot worse than sanctions. This is one of those cases that's very obvious. Same with, sure. with Iraq. There's, there was a lot of reporting that a lot of Iraqi children have died because of the sanctions we actually placed on Iraq. Now, um, at one point, they said like half a million and they actually ask. And this is like a huge quote from like her past. Like mm -hmm. she, she, we asked like uh, Bill Clinton's like security advisor, um, and they said like that the half a million children is like worth it. And later they had to bring that back because the number probably wasn't as accurate as it was. But that just sure. makes us like again optics disaster. If we just said yeah half a million dead kids, yeah, but our strategic interests, yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's really bad. But okay, so there's another reason why it's bad because we undercut the Iranian protesters. Uh, we undercut our allies in the region who now don't like, like, I mean, let's be honest. It's not like it's going to be new news. Like, oh, my God, America did a bad in Iraq. Like, that's not that's not something new. Mm -hmm. But like another reason now the Iraqi government is pretty opposed to us, except for the Kurds and the and the which, again, we backstabbed in Syria. Let's talk about that for a second. This like this doesn't make any sense when you like part with like Trump's decision in Syria. Right. By pulling out like that immensely helped Iran. But then we're going to put try to put Russia on Iran here. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Does that make any sense to you? By pulling out, wait, by pulling out of what? By pulling out of Syria, which gave Iran a strategic game because of, like, mm -hmm. Assad's his ally, that gave Iran more influence in Syria. But then we're like, okay, now let's put maximum pressure on Iran, and we're going to kill one of their top things and get inches away from war after we give them a victory in Syria. Well, doesn't I mean, like, any sense, does the, it? well, like, fr from my understanding of it, the, the bullshit game, the problem is that we were trying to play little proxy games in Syria, but other people were coming out in full force. China and Russia were sending help to Syria overtly. Iran, the Quds Force, was sending, you said 50,000 militiamen, like, overtly. Like, there was no way that us back like little separatist groups was ever going to like get rid of Assad. I, like we caught we the, the country was destabilized. No, like not, ISIS not, there, not but... get rid of. Mm -hmm. But it would have been very it would have been very good for us to actually make an agreement with Assad's government concerning the Kurds. Not only for the Kurds because they're a strategic ally to the U.S. and they have been for a very long time. Even mm -hmm. when we go back to Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. and um, when they were cast. But because you know the whole thing is Assad wants a centralized government, and we could have made a we could have easily made a deal with not easily, well, but, but we could have made a deal with Assad when it comes to a a more independent region. Uh, in northeastern Syria. Now, but my understanding, was, my understanding. Well, firstly, I don't know if I if that was true. And, and my understanding is that you really think Assad would have just given up the, all the oil fields in northeast Syria to, to who? To ISIS? Well, no, 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 not to ISIS. What I mean, the YPG, the SDF. So you think that he? You think that Assad would allow his autonomy, knowing that he has the full backing of Putin, to just give away like that part of the country? Like well, that, let's think about it. What's mm -hmm. happening in northeastern Syria right now? Turkey's invading, taking large swaths of the country, and Assad's mm -hmm. really pissed about it. If we could have weighed those options, like, hey, if you don't like this, we could have just... I mean, uh, this isn't something I would do because the humanitarian disaster that Turkey's invasion over in Syria could have done. Mm -hmm. But he could have been like, hey, we could, just, like, we could just let Turkey come in here. We'll allow them. They won't give the land back. Because Turkey has been arming, like, the FSA for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. And that is somebody who's directly opposed to Assad, has no compromise, and many of them are just straight-up terrorists when it comes to high-tier al-Sham and ISIS proxies and jihadi proxies who 
or committing war crimes and executing like political people mm -hmm. like all the time. So, I mean, like there, there's a lot of like political pressure there for sure. It was a stalemate where if he wanted to get his country, he would have had to make an agreement. Yeah. My no understanding, too, that. is that the U.S. would not consider. I don't know if this was true or not, but my understanding was that the U.S. wouldn't consider any type of agreement with Syria, with Assad that didn't involve him stepping down as well. Yes, but the, while I, I disagree, I disagree that that's the approach we should have taken because yeah, of course. Again, compromise on the international stage. But mm -hmm. that's what the majority of the U.S. foreign policy consensus was. So, still, pulling out of there was definitely not anything anyone wanted uh, because it was a huge strategic loss for America. The allowing uh, uh, Syria to to just roll into northeastern Syria by us backing out and saying we're just gonna pull off all of our oh oh out allowing Turkey to Turkey roll into northeastern Syria. Turkey rolled in, and then so now all they mm -hmm. can rely on, and now the YPG with russia because that's their only option now mm -hmm. so that was like a huge strategic loss and then you pair that with his decision in iraq and it makes it it shows to me that his foreign policy is inconsistent right well Which yeah I of course, well <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what trump dude i would pay i would serious to god i would pay a ten thousand dollar ticket to a private showing to just listen to trump talk about middle eastern politics for like <laughs> three hours i would love to hear i'm so oh fucking curious the dumb fucking shit that he would say about the different groups what operating do you think about oh my Soviet god afghan war is effect on how the middle east uh views uh, uh foreign powers from intervening the and, yeah not even yeah. that i'm just curious on his current day take of things i'm just i'm really curious what he thinks like is turkey what do you think of the conflict between uh between uh the uae and and abu Ghraib and like all these other uh -huh. states in saudi arabia and saudi arabia actually blockading some of our allies in the region uh, uh, well blockade is bad for trade bad for economy i want everybody to get along but i'll make a deal like like mm -hmm. it was, oh my god yeah, oh it's, man it's, it would be uh, very yeah so i don't think trump i don't even know it like so the foreign policy would be ran by what like pompeo or whatever um Mike Pompeo, basically. Yeah. I, I'm actually was very happy when John Bolton left because John Bolton, I, I, is a terrifying figure, sure. absolutely terrifying. I'm still scared that um, what's his face? Um, uh, Elliot Abrams is still in office when he literally has ties to war crimes, but mm -hmm. still. I, yeah, I don't know what the U.S. Ob I don't even know what the U.S. objective should be in the region at this point. Well, I mean, like I have my my borderline, I guess, almost hippieish ideas, like you do. Like I would love to see like U.S. and Iranian relations strengthened. Would be so cool, especially because in a roundabout way that helps us with Iraq because Iran has a huge hand in everything going on in Iraq yeah, as well. Again, like the Iran deal was like <sighs> fucking, but because that was a stepping stone for us dealing with that to dealing with the situation within Iraq because Iraq right now is going to be torn to shreds right now. I mean, from everything I know, now let's we've, we've been going for a while, but. What do we think Iran's response is going to be? And this is the, the final reason why I, I, I think for, for a multitude of other reasons. Well, not the final one, but the most and other important one. Why this was a bad move. Why it was a bad move to kill uh, Soleimani mm -hmm. is that the response we will get from from Saudi, from Saudi Arabia, from Iran, is almost certain. Like they've promised they will retaliate. Mm -hmm. They've sworn they're going to retaliate. Uh, Iraqi, uh, Iranian, like allied militias and I in Iraq have already been called back into service that fought during the Iraq war mm -hmm. against us. Uh, Hezbollah has already threatened to Israel. It threatens, our, uh, they're going to be able to, all the fronts they could fight us on, we, they could strike us from southern Lebanon or, and attack Israel. They could use the Houthi rebels to mount an offensive or maybe strike at Saudi Arabian oil infrastructure or military bases. They could go do something in Bahrain with the embassy there. They could, they, of course, the most obvious is in Iraq, where they have tons of militia that live with the government, and they could split that government in half. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is there is so much damage they can do with us. And this idea that then Trump is like, okay, we will we will commit a war crime if you do anything, that has escalated the the idea for conflict tremendously. And if the main concern from um, most people that I've heard is that we want to, you know, the reason why we need to kill Soleimani is because of the huge civilian loss of life and the killing of our soldiers. This, what we did, puts more civilians at risk and could kill more American soldiers than Soleimani ever could have. Sure. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> That's a rough one, my dude. Yeah, it is a rough one. I mean, me personally, I'm, I'm very, very solid. Like, we shouldn't have done. Not to mention, even talk to fucking Congress beforehand. Or actually, some people, members of Congress, have said they did talk to him, but they're all Gross. Republicans. Some Republican meaning, members, yeah. Meaning, either they're lying, which I think is the most likely, or he told the Republican Party that he was going to do a military attack before he told any other anybody else, which would be extremely worrying for our national security. That that, that national security would become a partisan issue when it comes to this informing Congress. And well, I mean, yeah, I mean, national security already in terms of people opinions is already like pretty fucking partisan um one of my favorite uh polling data i think was it had to do with um, representatives of congress and how they felt about bombing syria and i think democrats 
were pretty consistent in being opposed to it. But for the Republicans, it was like when 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 Obama did it, it was like a 20 percent approval or whatever. And then when Trump did it, it was like 94 percent approval. It was what, what exact policy was it again? Um, I, it had to do with um, it had to do with launching attacks against Syria. And so it was with Trump bombing the Syria. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. It was tr- with Trump bombing the Syrian airport in response to Assad, the gas attack. You remember when Trump did that? Oh, yeah, it was. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. You know what this reminds me a lot of uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare and the difference between um, oh, like, the support for ratings. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, how the Affordable Care Act had a, like an over 50 percent approval rating, mm-hmm. but Obamacare had over uh, had under 50 percent. Yeah. And it was just because Obama was tied to one of those names. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's a lot like that. People, I'm gonna be honest. People do not care much about my career or like the type of stuff. Like, not not my specific career, but you know, foreign policy. For sure. Um, it, it's it's quite it's quite a bummer because I remember like the whole reason I got into foreign policy was because I remember I was in high school and I was talking to my government teacher and I was explaining like why this one politician was like I think they were bad because of a decision they made foreign policy wise. And eventually he looked back at me and was like, I agree with you, but nobody cares about foreign policy, so I'm gonna vote for them anyway. Yeah. Uh, which really pissed me off that like my government teacher told me that and that mm-hmm. like helped set my like career for the rest of my life. Yeah. Which, you know, origin story. Yeah, but the pro- like foreign policy stuff is just not felt immediately. Like all of this stuff is like such a long game and long term stuff that it's hard to get people to like really care that much about it. Like, that's another thing. We could maybe not see the resp- like the immediate response for this for years. Yeah. Like uh, I, mean, I mean, like the whole thing of Iran is like asymmetrical warfare, right? Of course. Yeah. Um. So they're not going to just like. There's a good chance that while a lot of people are going to think we're in the clear, we're not going to see it for another two years until we really see some shit start kicking up. Mm-hmm. Because that would strategically, in my opinion, that should be the smartest thing they could possibly do is wait a little bit, wait for everything to kind of boil up and then do it and mm-hmm. then attack. Because we have already made a ton of blunders since we've done it with like the announcement we're going to attack cultural sites and other thing. They might just wait for Trump to make a few more blunders. Mm-hmm. And then right when the next president gets in office, Take that big then they Amazon strike. money, boy. Did you? Um, oh, I linked you that the uh, polling or whatever. Uh, just that image your album. The difference between the support for airstrikes in Syria. Um, the Democrats like pretty consistently didn't support it in 2013 or in 2017. And then the yeah. difference in Republican support when it was yeah, Trump. Yeah, I mean, like for everybody, <laughs> for instance, remember, like, Holy I, I'm not a huge Hillary Clinton fan, but this is something she wouldn't have done. She was very obvious. Like this idea, like I voted for Trump because I didn't want to go to war. And and now these people like out of nowhere just beating the drum. Yeah, like, I I ran. Fucking I ran. Yeah, amen. He them. assassinated the dude. Fuck that. Yeah, we were talking like red line in the sand. Uh oh, Hillary's like gonna start World War Three, but then it's like fucking I mean, bring World War Three on. Let's yeah. Zone. Because of a no-fly zone, which yeah. this this risk war a lot more than a no-fly zone ever could have risked war. Mm-hmm. Even though, like, there, there's a very good argument against a no-fly zone. Even though, like, this this risk war a lot more because we directly attacked a a, a nation's uh, foreign policy asset, uh, and not only foreign policy asset, but somebody who's known as like a literal fucking cult icon in, in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we've undermined the protesters in Iran. We've undermined our relationship with Iraq to the point where they want us to leave, which is also going to help Iran and Iraq, which was the exact opposite of what we wanted to do. We've put uh, U.S. interests and U.S. Uh, service members in there at risk. We've had to deploy more service members in response. We put Iraqi civilians, Yemeni civilians, uh, Israeli civilians, Lebanese civilians, Bahrainian civilians, all at risk in the region. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, we put Iranian, uh, uh, Iranians, of course, at risk. And if any war was to break out, it would be a huge bombing campaign when we talk about the geography of Iran. In my opinion, this is probably one of the worst decisions Trump has made when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, only, only second to his decision in Syria. Yeah. Oh, and of course, his original thing to get out of the uh, Iran. Iran deal. Yeah. Yeah. The sad thing was that I think that the European countries that were involved in that joint action deal or whatever, I think they were actually managing to keep it together, too. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That so Iran this, said they would the still adhere is, to it and there were other European ten countries. 10 days. Were. He did this 10 days before they were uh, another 60-day deadline was going to be where they were going to throw off a few more provisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, because what they've been doing ever since like we fucked them over is that every 60 days they take away another provision saying hey the, the agreement's still there it's still open and i think they were maybe going to wait till like the next president to give it like one last shot and sure. then we're going to abandon it but now it's just completely out the window now a, a new u.s president i there's no way like i heard like amy klobuchar and this really pissed me off when she said this like well maybe we should make it more stringent when we make the new deal because trump killed it like after doing that, like we we'd be lucky if we got the old deal and it's, as it was, we'd be very lucky if we got the old deal as it was. That really pissed me off. Yeah. And at this point, after we kill this, like we'd be lucky if we got eighty percent of the old deal. Yeah. Well, what are you gonna do? What are we gonna do exactly? 
Uh, is there any other questions you have about the situation or any other thoughts you want? Or Well, after all this, do you still think it's like a dicey if we should have done it or not? Um, I mean, we, I mean, I, yeah, we probably, I don't think we should have. We probably shouldn't have. So would you say destiny? The the only thing, the only thing that it rests on, the only question I have that I don't remember what your, mm -hmm. what you felt like your conclusion was, was the idea of whether or not he was actually like in the final stages of planning like other attacks. I, against, I can, I can mm -hmm. tell you right now, there is nearly at this point, and they've actually said, they've been asked, will you reveal the rest of the evidence? And mm -hmm. they said, the do nothing Democrats would never, no matter what, they're going to support Salmani, so we're not going to do it, which mm -hmm. suggests to me that there's not really a lot there. Maybe, and the yeah. evidence that we have seen so far that they, that strung shit together literally could mean anything. And it, and it completely coincides with Soleimani's previous actions. And if it was like an imminent attack or something, then why was it only in, he made the decision after the embassy attack? When yeah. it, isn't that a little weird that it was like immediately after the embassy attack? He would have done it like maybe yeah like i think before at a different yeah. point or he would have like if it was imminent maybe you could make an argument for not telling cockroach right away if it was an imminent attack mm -hmm. but it it didn't seem imminent i mean yeah. I, I don't know the fact of the no matter it, it would seem like like using our brains it would seem like there probably wasn't an imminent one otherwise when he was presented with the options of what to strike so Liamani probably wouldn't have been so far down the list would well, be you my need guess to calm down you're using your brain now you need to calm down man yeah it seems like um yeah it seems like it probably wasn't very credible but yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like all evidence I have seen at this point mm -hmm. does not point. Oh, by the way, it, it this the other thing made me not credible. Did you see Mike Pence trying to tie this to 9/11? How scary that is! How 2003 <laughs> that sounds. And I like I went back and checked. There is not even a single mention of Soleimani in like the like I like in all the documents that we produced after Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence whatsoever. That's just a complete lie. That's just. But you know, I'm happy to continue the tradition of vice presidents using 9/11 to bring us into disastrous military conflicts. Wait, I'm sorry. Say that last thing again. Sorry. Holy shit. I said I'm very happy is continuing to the tradition of vice presidents bringing us into disastrous military oh. conflicts using 9-11 as the flag. 9-11. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another thing. Like, why would they be like bringing the? Now it sounds like you're just throwing anything at the wall that will stick mm -hmm. because there's not really much there because most people are just like, this is fucking bullshit. Mm -hmm. So that further suggests to me that there wasn't much there. And it's and until they show us, which they're not going to. And so unless there's like a Freedom of Information Act request or some leak, yeah. uh, I, I we're probably not going to find out until like 10 years from now that it was complete bullshit yeah well for your requests are you're never going to get something this recent like right like, yeah that's why we just got the afghanistan papers is because it, we the washington post won the freedom of information Act request mm -hmm. and it took them fucking like four or five years so yeah it's going to take way too long and plus you got to wait for a certain amount of time to pass before you even really exactly stuff. yeah when it's not relevant anymore and yeah. if we're still if they still deem that we're in like a conflict with iran which five years from now is definitely more likely definitely if we're maybe even at a war with iran mm -hmm. then um then it's definitely not going to be something I'm going to release. Yeah, we or if it is released, it's going to be so insanely redacted that it's going to be meaningless yeah. anyway. Yeah, like the full sheets on the Mueller report that's just completely redacted. Yeah, yeah. But so that's another thing that suggests to me. So that would be my thing, and that I'm, I would say I am ninety percent sure. Of course, I could always be wrong. Mm -hmm. That there was no evidence of an imminent attack on U.S. resources. Maybe one like months out from now. But mm -hmm. then if there was one months out from now, and that's why we killed him now, then there was a lot of other ways we could have approached this than just killing him, which okay. would have actually helped support our argument for sanctions and throwing out the Iran deal, which would have made a uh, made a really good like example from Trump's position. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the Do last you... thing I should say yeah, go. Um, is that um, from everything I've read, that when he made the decision to strike Soleimani, we mm -hmm. were not prepared to do it at all, and we fucking scrambled fast. Yeah, I read that further, the same. Like, yeah, so that which, again, is in my point, like, if you're going to do an operation, and you're both, like, completely, like, butching it, like, 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 screwing it up like that that's another reason why you shouldn't do it if you're gonna rush it because if you mess something like that up uh it could lead to horrible relations with the host country because you can kill civilians or in this instance a member of their military yeah a, a borderline celebrity too not just a military guy yeah yeah well and the military member in iraq which undercut our influence in iraq mm -hmm. so you had another question um oh i was gonna ask do you think there's any chance that the that this impeachment stuff will hurt trump at all um this is going a, a little bit farther back not as recent um i personally like I, i'll give you a personal example recently i made a i made a document uh, on the iran like what's going on with iran it was supposed to be for release right mm -hmm. for campaign release because i work for these campaigns at the moment and um somebody else decided to grab it and edit 95 percent of my stuff and make it about impeachment and the amount that pissed me off is i think probably the amount the american people are going to be pissed off when 
like we're trying to talk about like healthcare or something else. I don't think this is going to really hurt him too much. Mm -hmm. uh, every po all the polling recently that I suggest suggests like he's back at almost a fifty percent approval rating. It's insane. Yeah. Well, the Republican um, approval for Trump like just doesn't seem to budge. Yeah, yeah. I, I I honestly think um, while I do well, I think there's a, an extreme moral case for impeachment. Um, it's there and I, and I, and it's kind of gonna be hard for me to like, and this is a more hippy dippy shit, but it's gonna be hard for me to look my kids in the face and say, we didn't do everything we could to stop Trump. But, um, electorally, like, I don't think it's gonna hurt him that much. Yeah, I don't. For sure. My I biggest stuff worry like on this, stuff like, on stuff on this would actually hurt him much more. Yeah. My biggest worry on, on, on impeachment related stuff has been, always has been the idea that like, it would be really scary to like empower his base. And that kind of seems to be, you ever watch Dragon Ball Z? Uh, yes, I have. The, was it like you know how like Vegeta like every time he fights a stronger opponent he gets like stronger and stronger and that's like his kind of thing or whatever and he like yeah like, every time he gets the shit beat out of him he gets yeah stronger, that it seems to thing. be the case with the Republicans that any time you attack anybody related to them that person grows more and more in power like Kavanaugh got more popular in the rape hearings like Trump seems to get more popular like every time he gets attacked by people like the approval rating seems to go up and up like it just seems to be not a very effective strategy of dealing I with mean, them. like I mean yeah I mean like it's to the point where I feel like Trump could like with his party of Ellie Gallagher for example he could literally commit war crimes and people would be like well i mean those civilians weren't giving us the side eye though yeah the smartest you know, thing that trump ever said was um what was it that i could shoot someone on sixth street and my supporters yeah so... I, yeah yeah that's the smartest <laughs> thing he said <laughs> honestly the way the ability he has to create a post cult of personality mm -hmm. if for somebody who works in politics people would actually like murder for that would type kill of, for that like, yeah, yeah ac actually you told me to um the last time we talked do you remember recommending a book to me so I remember recommending a book to you. I do not recommend recommending a book. It to was you. a book called Behind the Backlash. Uh, I did not recommend that to you. Wait, did you not? Are you sure you didn't? I'm no, I don't. I barely read. Oh, f amen, brother. Oh well, fuck. Wait, who recommended me that book? Oh, I'm super curious. I don't know, but maybe it's good. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it was really you good. I read, read it actually. You can no, read, you, you, should, should you should. You should read more. You should read oh, more. Oh, you liked it? Well, then yes, I recommend. Yeah, it I'm too. trying to. Oh god. Oh, was it Doug? Oh no, Doug read it. Fuck, Doug. Doug recommended it to me. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. I should have took the credit for that. You should have. It. Um. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. One of the things that I like about um, I like this about anything, but one of the things I like about history, um, I hate history by the way. But if I had to like oh, history, damn. one of the things I like about history is that like when you read one thing, like nothing makes sense, and then when you read like two or three things, like you kind of don't really understand what's going on. But when you start to read more things, all of a sudden it's like you have these huge Lego blocks that you're like connecting from doing things. Like holy shit, like that makes sense because of that. And all of a sudden, like all mm -hmm. the names and everything start to connect more, and you start, and then all of a sudden you start to realize that like nothing in history is very random. There aren't just like these things yeah. that happen. Like everything is like ultra super fucking interconnected. I mean, that's, that's really interesting to me. I like that aspect of, of reading anything historical or whatever. Oh yeah, it's super, it's super cool to do that. For instance, um, I've, I've been doing recently. I've been studying a little bit of Vietnam. I've been trying to get, learn more about that because you know there's a ton of modern comparables, mm -hmm. like parallels you can make. Course, and I, yeah. and I learned that uh, the Viet Cong actually supported us uh, until we invaded. Um, they have like uh, Ho Chi Minh opened up a speech, uh, his like independence speech in 1945 after World War II ended mm -hmm. with like a quote from Andrew Jackson. He called, he originally called his Viet Cong the Viet Americans, no joke. Nice. Um, like it was a huge influence, but uh, under FDR, but once FDR died and the new guy came in, he was like, we need to fight these commies. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting can... how opinions on things change. Like Reagan yeah. giving a speech on how important amnesty is. And <laughs> like, it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. But, but when it comes to that specifically, mm -hmm. um, the idea that like, domino theory in Vietnam like doesn't really I don't think it like ever made sense considering Ho Chi Minh was more of a nationalist than he was ever a communist and then uh, and when you compare that to the fact that Vietnam has always had conflicts with China the idea that China and Vietnam were going to unite for communism mm -hmm. and then Vietnam like later would like invade China's ally in like Pol Pot and depose him because he's fucking Pol Pot and then had a war the Zio, the Sino Vietnamese war and then would immediately once like everything's like settled make uh, and uh, basically make trade ties with America and like before even like making relations with china um it, it's like things are a lot more complicated than they seem and i feel like neocon foreign policy has always been like just here's a hammer uh domination time yeah a little bit yeah um yeah. okay um wait okay, so, bastiat um, wants to jump in real quick do you want me to drag him in yeah or? sure 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 but um join the call and shred your domino theory rejection oh yeah because we've all talked about this before i don't know much about domino theory specifically but i do want to ask you first mm -hmm. so would you say now that that you think it was a bad thing most likely wait wait i'm sorry hold on um wait hold on i'm sorry wait oh wait oh i thought i was getting a call from somebody um i'm sorry oh. do i think that um uh the, the uh, assassination thing. 
Yeah. Um, I, it, it it rests on that on that foreign intel. Like I, it feels like the answer is it was probably a bad thing. Um, unless they thing. really did have like credible intel that he was about to like that he was in the final stages of planning like some crazy attacks. But otherwise, yeah, it was but, probably a bad. I thing. I mean, but all signs point to no from like how the administration and everybody. Yeah, it was seems acting. to be the case the because if the, if the sign was yes, this would have been like a particular briefing on a thing, not like here is your briefing, here are some things we could do. It would have been a more pointed like, yo, this is going to happen. We need to we take need him to, out yeah. because Americans are going to die. And it wouldn't have been like a fact. scrambling to put together an operation or whatever. Yeah, and, not yeah. to mention that there was actually officials like in his administration saying. We shouldn't do this, man. Which yeah. would be weird for Americans to be like, we should let Americans die yeah. in this in this instance, which again would counter that. Yeah, and Benghazi ourselves, yeah. Yeah, so it probably yeah. seems like it, from a strategic point of view, it wasn't a good idea. So would you say that I want to debate with Destiny? I guess. I don't think it was a debate. I wasn't. I don't have a very strong opinion on it. But uh, never um, mind. I just needed to say that. You won. Okay. Well, say you won the debate. Take the take awesome. the take the W. Okay. So you got a ninety-nine and one record now. Um. Well, I'm, it depends I'm, on your you ask. I'm, some I'm people have lost every I'm single debate. Douglas? Buster Douglas, Mike Tyson. There we go. Thank you. DB Gus in the chat. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. I just need to be an asshole. Okay. Bring it up. Bring it boss yet. All right. Hold on one second. Did you? Um, oh, I sent you a friend request. You have to accept it so I can. Oh, and what? A Discord? Yeah. Do we have to be uh, friends to drag people in? Sure. We can be friends. I'll, I'll be your friend. Thanks, bud. I appreciate it. Wait, are we friends, boss? Yet? Hold on. Oh my god. Test. Right click. Oh, we're not friends either. Hold on. Hey there, folks. How you doing today? Hey, what's up? Well, I hope you're enjoying that W, uh, Dylan, because I have to say I am appalled at the degree uh, of 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 frankly naivete if i may oh, be so bold as to say so Wait, in 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 this discussion uh you know this idea that the united states has not benefited substantially by killing this terrorist mastermind who has had his hands in every one of iran's proxy wars throughout the middle east we basically killed eisenhower before d-day right here right? we killed somebody who's 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 skill uh, and whose experience in Iranian military asymmetrical warfare is unmatched. He can't just be replaced, and the United States is safer for it. What do you say to that? Well, I would say that what I would say that's wrong for number one. Um, there, his deputy chief has extensive skill, and I would say why he couldn't perform to the same ability as this man did. This will mean that more resources will actually be available to the Quds Force, which actually might put us in more danger if we didn't kill Soleimani, even though, of course, Buddy can never make up for skill. Then there's also the fact that you're making American interests in the region at more risk from, Amer from Iranian attacks. So for, if your main thing is protecting mm -hmm. American interests, this mm -hmm. actually is prodding Iraq for a response. Yeah, let's see. What's interesting about this and claim is it reminds me of the claim that uh, that, uh, you know, some some Democrats will say, well, we can't get more extreme because the Republicans, you know, they might react to us. They might get worse to which the most recent response is how could they get any worse? You know, how could Iran get any worse sponsoring all these proxy regimes engaged in a campaign of terrorist attacks around the world since the 1980s against not just the United States, but our allies in Israel and in the Gulf states? What are they going to do that they're honestly not already either doing or trying and failing to do thanks to our so, brave armed forces? So, something that I'd like to hear you two talk about, because I think the focus of this isn't necessarily on Iran, because I, because mm -hmm. I agree for the most part with everything you're saying right now, Bastia. I think my biggest problem is the killing him in in Iraq um, with the yeah. Iraqi military person as well. That seems like a really hard sell to me. Okay, go. Well, I'll tell you, you know, it's it's not ideal. Of course, it is not ideal. It would have been much better if we didn't have to drag Iraq into this uh, because you're right. That, that comes at a cost of relationship there with, with Iraq, and, and it's a big cost. I mean, they're, they're trying to convince us to, to leave the country, uh, you know, and that's, well, I guess they're asking us, not trying to convince us. But, you know, I, I think we've got, to, we've got to think about this from a cost-benefit perspective at the end of the day. If the cost uh, was if, our— If the relationship was is when, yeah, if our cost is with Iraq, we've got other allies in the region we can project power from. Wait, No. That's an incredibly naive view of that firewall of countries that could theoretically be aligned. There is no replacement for Iraq when it comes to Iran and Syria. Like just losing the seeding them completely to, to create that trifecta of like of, of interest there seems to be a really bad idea geopolitically. No? Well, now, it, it depends on what you mean by losing it. Do you mean, for example, that the country without American troops is going to fall to Iranian influence? Because it doesn't seem like American troops have prevented Iran from already having influence. Apparently, this leader was invited to the country 
uh, or this guy was invited to Iraq to, uh, you know, despite the fact that, that America has been, uh, has had soldiers in Iraq. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it is that we're losing in terms of our ability, especially to deal with Syria, where the president has already pulled the rug out from under our, our allies there in Syria. So, I mean, pre, maybe, maybe while we were still, still seriously committed in Syria, you know, I can see what you're saying, but, but since we sold out the Kurds, since we betrayed the Kurds, what is it, what else do we have left to lose there at this point? I mean, well, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, well, number one, um, we've lost the complete support of the Iraqi government and any, and definitely the support of the Iraqi military, making the argument for an, for an Iraqi soldier, for example, to defend American troops when we've already killed their soldiers. Mm -hmm. I mean, killed them blatantly, no matter the ties to Iranian government, we killed them blatantly. The, the, the ability for them to now further dig the claws into Iraq has been increased by this. Now, it won't be Soleimani being the person doing this, but let me tell you, there are many, many, many capable people with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps whose whole job for the last decade has been being trained to fight yes. our interests in the region. Yes. Not to mention that they've been showed constantly been able to bomb Saudi, um, uh, Saudi oil interests and cut the production by 50%. These different attacks are going to ramp up. Their, their ability to convince their population mm -hmm. to cut more in social spending and invest more in military just been increased. They've had a huge internal conflict with their population, protesters going constantly against the government, being mowed down, but continuing mm -hmm. to, because of the cuts of fuel sure. subsidies and helping their population, that money is going to be now d redirected, which already was in the last bill just passed, which also mm -hmm. designated an American interest terrorist organization, which would, would allow Iran to strike us uh, directly. Not only will that allow that. But now with more funding, they'll be able to do more operations when it comes to Hezbollah against Israel, when it comes to uh, inf more influence in Bahrain, when it comes mm -hmm. to Yemen and Houthis striking a yeah. against oh, a, yeah. Yemen, uh, against Saudi. I mean, there. if anything, this has maybe actually expanded Iran's mm -hmm. uh, uh, influence in the region. No, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Hezbollah, because when you talk about the attacks uh, uh, that, that, uh, that, that Iran could, could launch through Hezbollah, I have to think back to history, you know, to the 1983 Beirut bombings, where they killed almost 300 Americans, as well as, I think, like 50 French peacekeepers. The uh, Kobar Towers bombing in 1996, when Iran killed 20 U.S. servicemen, a federal judge found in 2006 that the evidence firmly established that it was planned, funded, and sponsored by senior leadership in the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Mm -hmm. That is not to say even a proxy. Yeah. Literally, the Iranian government itself, yeah. they have been engaged in this kind of activity, these kinds of attacks against Americans for decades now. The USS Cole, apparently they've got some involvement with that. Um, and while I don't see any kind of solid evidence of, a, you know, really any solid evidence of any kind of connection to 9-11, of course, we know, tragically enough, 9-11 is not the sole example of uh, anti-American terror in, in uh, recent history. So I, I have to say this notion that by taking out one of their competent actors, they're somehow going to get worse than they already are. The best I can see to that is that maybe if the president had a, had already uh, done his best to shred the Iran deal, we would have kept some of that. But... I, I, I'm not sure, honestly, what we're losing. I mean, I feel like we're only losing something if the United States is somehow vulnerable uh, now to something that was not already vulnerable to uh, from Iran. I just don't well, see that. Of course there's more things vulnerable. Number one, of course, more funding is obviously hmm. going to make us more okay, vulnerable. Yeah, one, one not more only more. That. One more point to that. Iran has been surrounded for the last 20 years by American occupations in Afghanistan, in Iraq, administrations talking about going to war in Iran for, for uh, again, since 9-11. Uh, what, how could they, with these kinds of resources uh, uh, surrounding them, right, with, with this ring of American military power around them, how are they not already committing everything they could commit uh, uh, to, to undermining American objectives? Asymmetrical warfare, which of course the Quds forces specialize in, but his deputy chief uh, person who has now replaced him also specialized in, who's been training him for the last fucking 20 years. This idea that now that we've taken out Soleimani, that this is going yeah. to collapse the Quds forces' <clears throat> ability to do anything. Mm -hmm. If anything, the yeah. Quds forces have directly gotten more funding by over $224 million. That is a huge boost in funding when it comes to the Quds forces. I'm, you know, let's be completely honest. Yeah, I, I see, I don't, I don't, I don't doubt uh, that, that uh, uh, for the moment, there is greater outrage as a result of this man's death. What I question is that his death is a game changer in any appreciable way. He is, uh, he is a, a, it seems like a game changer with respect to undermining their, their experience, that irreplaceable human experience that this man has developed since since he got into uh, into the, into the Iranian military with the Iran Iraq War, but beyond that, I, I have to say I don't see what it is going to do uh, to the United States because at the end of the day, Iran has already faced serious threats from our president, President Trump, 
uh, since this attack. And now he's got every reason to follow through with these publicly stated threats. And I mean, if, for you to say, well, two years, three years, something could happen. OK, but but in two or three years, I mean, history has shown that that something could already happen. Indeed, Iran has already taken action against American lives in, in the uh, in the recent past. Okay, number one, with Trump's response, one of those responses would be a war crime, as designated by international law and domestic U.S. law when it comes to the uh, War Crimes Act in America, which was passed in 1996. So his response, he's threatened war crimes since he has been in office. We had a discussion about this earlier, and you agreed with me that he's threatened war crimes. Mm. Now, when it comes to uh, the response from Iran, of course they've done bad things, past, and they were going to continue to do bad things to us in the, uh, if, if this hadn't happened or not. The, amount, the difference is the amount of bad shit they did, the scale of the stuff they did, and where they're going to do it, and where they're going to hype it up. Iraq now— But also, real quick, just as a just as a point of reference for that, that when we say, like, Iran has done bad stuff, some of this is in opposition to U.S. activity as well, right? So, for instance, like, we massively supported a lot of the opposition in Syria. So it's not completely random that Iran would try to support some of the opposition to the opposition to keep Assad there. Like, that's not totally un unbelievable or, like, I can't believe they would do that, right? Of course not. Of course yeah. not. If anything, though, this gives them the ability and like plausible deniability in the future. Like, just going a lot harder towards it. Not to mention the designated of American of Americans as terrorists. While, uh, well, not all Americans, but the American military as terrorists yeah. allows them to attack us directly. Now we can say in the future, like, how dare they attack us directly? And now we spawned with with force. Well, then we just started a war with Iran, which I has tremendous say, human <clears throat> cost. Dylan, the the declaration of American soldiers as terrorists. Uh, I, I'm really skeptical that that is going to change things in a meaningful way, given that, again, the 20 American servicemen who died in the Kobar Towers bombing weren't deemed to be terrorists, and yet they were directly killed by the Iranian regime. I mean, so I just this notion that like no, so wait, when you say directly back, killed, when they've you been holding back. Killed, you mean yeah, that let, Iranian let soldiers went in there with bombs, or do you mean it was through I, why, like, uh, or it was a funded terrorist that they right. funded terrorists that did it? Because that's a right. totally different situation. Because then what we did is we killed them directly with our military forces. Okay, planned, funded, and sponsored. So basically, so it is a the difference is the difference is that uh, yeah, a different person may be carrying it out. So that's Iran a proxy. Planned, funded, sponsored, senior leadership was involved. It, it, it's everything except the person pulling the trigger. I mean, is there which is everything? In, and that's there? everything in foreign policy. When you do stuff directly, that removes all plausible deniability and completely change your standing on the international stage. You know, uh, I, that, that, that's an interesting question you bring. Plausible deniability. All right. How much value does plausible deniability have uh, just kind of at, at, at base? Uh, for example, Israel denies that it has 200 nuclear weapons, but it is commonly acknowledged that Israel is a nuclear power. So where, you know, plausible well, deniability so when we talk about plausible like deniability, has value well, sometimes, oh, but not just, you know, not well, When we talk about plausible deniability, so like the difference between like a proxy war and an upfront war is like very, very, very fucking different, right? Like us funneling arms through Turkey to like the FSA or whatever in Syria is a lot different than literally the U.S. putting troops on the ground in Syria, right? Like we, we can kind of like wash our hands of whatever bullshit underground support we do, but like an upfront like military operation for a country like the United States is going to play a lot differently on the like worldwide like political level, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll grant you there's more political fallout from it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we're not talking just about political fallout, though. I mean, three days ago or four days ago when this happened, the immediate talk was about World War Three. I mean, Dylan, I remember when you called in the stream, you sounded audibly spooked by that prospect. Yes, and I am audibly spooked. we're reduced spooked. to talking about, well, you know, political fallout. I mean, well, not I, just I mean, at a certain, at a certain this could spiral out in mind war. here. Do you not see how this could spiral out into a war if Iran does have a response that kills U.S. Mm -hmm. soldiers, which is very likely. Not to mention, if Iran, if they just are sponsoring an Iranian proxy, which they have done for years, which ends mm -hmm. up killing U.S. soldiers, could end up with us committing war crimes against the uh, against the Iranian state. Wow. Now, I, uh, I I heartily reject the president's approach. Uh, I think that when he threatens war crimes, he's absolutely monstrous in doing so, and I do not mean to defend the president in any uh, in any fashion with respect. Then, to his then do you deny crime. that this is an escalation that could spiral out into a war by him making that statement about the fifty two about the fifty two? See, I, I I question that that is going to particularly change much. I think it is. Again, I I think that. Uh, the reason I question whether that is going to change much in terms of Iran's response is the same reason I question whether it's going to change much in terms of uh, America's killing of Soleimani in the first place. At the end of the day, we're talking about powers that are not equal in strength. If Iran takes direct action, Iran 
is is very likely to face something approaching total devastation. Well, whereas the United States has has uh, full power to deter Iran's uh, Iran's conventional uh, attacks. Well, what kind of total yeah. devastation do you think Iran could possibly face? Like the U.S. isn't going to put troops on the ground in Iran, and any type of asymmetrical warfare is always going to apply more pressure politically on U.S. leaders than on Iranian leaders. The United States bombing has uh, has engaged in some in some thoroughly brutal bombing campaigns uh, that have not required any soldiers on the ground, and I don't know what this president is capable of. And I would imagine the leadership in Iran, considering how how open we are about saying we don't know what this president is capable of, I imagine leadership of Iran has at least considered the possibility now, that this president is unhinged and might actually follow up with his. How president. much do you know about internal Iranian politics? Because everything you're saying does not line up with internal Iranian politics when it comes well, well, to the influence of the Iranian. Revolution, Revolutionary Guard Corps has and have one of the most senior members, the most important members killed. Mm -hmm. They basically control politics in Iran if we're getting really so real you, about it. Yeah, and I, you're going to tell I, me I, that they're just going to tell the Iranian government and where they're most definitely the Iranian, they're going to be pressuring the Iranian government to have a severe response either through a proxy or even possibly directly. Yeah. And from everything yeah. I've heard from sources on the ground, that mm -hmm. is something that is on the table from my contact. Yeah. Yeah. That is definitely something that's on the yeah. table. Right. And you're going to tell me that those Iranian proxies in, Syria, in Iraq, which has uh -huh. already been a battleground, and they've killed Iran American yeah. contractors literally yeah. just a few weeks ago, that, yeah. that that targeting of American troops could not spiral sure. out into a great war. Here's, here's my point. Undermine our complete influence in the Middle East. What they're doing with proxies, I'm saying that they already have been doing with proxies, and what they would do directly, I'm saying they are already not going to do directly because a direct attack on the United States is very different than a direct attack on Iran. Iran, oh. compared to the United States, is a weak country. The United States is, for better or for worse, depending on your perspective, the most powerful military entity in the history of mankind, and has full power to devastate Iran in response to a direct attack. So this notion that we're going to face something different than we've already faced... Again, I, I don't see that we're already not facing the full force of Iran's proxy attacks, but there is one thing we won't be facing anymore, which is Soleimani. uh, Qassam Soleimani's involvement. Well, in well let's attacks. talk about this. Well, now, since these attacks are definitely going to escalate in, in amount, definitely in Iraq, that's an undeniable that it's most definitely going to at least change the board in there. Not even if it's just from local Iraqis who are pissed that we killed the military official uh, in, in the strike as well, which, of course, the strike was Russia. Maybe it was done through that or maybe it was done because it's part of the PMF. Uh, but who knows? When it comes to when it comes to that specifically. Um, there's going to be a rapid enough of attack. And with mm -hmm. a rapid enough attack, there's a lot of room for mistakes. A lot of room for mistakes. And mm -hmm. mistakes, as we know, can cause wars. And mm -hmm. with more of these operations just happening generally, even if there's higher scale and you say, well, they're happening anyway, more of these attacks, if a mistake happens, that could spiral out into a conflict. We are undermining the same people that Soleimani killed. If you really, I mean, really, if we really care I mean, at the end of the day about American lives in the region or, or civilian lives in the region, killing Soleimani and letting the spiral and this the possibility for this to spiral into a conflict is going to kill could kill more people than Soleimani ever could have killed on his own. That's I, I while I don't deny the hypothetical possibility, I would request that you acknowledge it is nevertheless a hypothetical. A and hypothetical, a very likely hypothetical. Grounded in, I think it's a lot more grounded in plausible, uh, plausible reality. Well, what I'm grounded is is, is like, long-standing Iranian policy. If there's something, and maybe you can help me with this point. If you can uh, explain to me how proxy attacks are going to get worse, like what was Iran holding back on with respect to its proxy attacks, uh, to its proxy involvement in the Middle East? What were they holding back on that now they're going to unleash? Direct attack on American soldiers. Okay, so if we got well, direct attack on American soldiers. Hold on, wait, real quick, real quick. So direct attacks on American soldiers already happened when the U.S. was occupying Iraq. Um, like the Iran— That's true, when yeah. it comes to Iraq, occupying Iraq. But we were not going to go into a wider conflict with Iran while we were also fighting Iraq and also fighting in all these in, in Afghanistan. The the political consequences of that, not to mention the amount of American war fatigue uh, mm -hmm. that would have expanded, uh, mm -hmm. would have made a, a war with Iraq. Iran a political suicide and of course we need to think this is an election year so we need we need to think about uh responses being it, it is an election year sure um, well hmm. what do you what do you mean by that well it's an election year going to yeah. war with Iran while while there's there's political calculation of well if you go to war with Iran that means you're going to get reelected because you went to war but but I, I think that I think Trump knows on a deep down level that going to war with Iran it's it's not something that really he's he's able to do while keeping a very high popularity. People don't want to war with Iran. If we're really being honest, people do not want to war with Iran. You know, destiny statistics just or destiny study just showed that Trump supporters want whatever Trump wants. That's true, but that Trump supporters did not make up the majority of the country. Terrifyingly lopsided in terms of just Trump supporters, how quickly a Trump change supporters, in the name of the president. Trump supporters and, and aren't the majority of the country. Apparently, thirty percent of Democrats are open to the possibility. You, I mean, that you, was Syria, as, not uh, Iran. As, you as a moderate uh, Hillary Clinton supporter. You would 
would know that Trump supporters are not the majority of the country, sadly. Okay, yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, not sadly, we don't need to bring we don't need to bring Secretary Clinton in. That's okay. All right. Okay. I mean, let's 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 be honest that this this is an election season. But when, yeah. when when it comes to Iranian politics, we we not only piss off the leader of the country who was good friends with uh -huh. us, piss off the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. The, Wait, the, who was good friends with us? Uh, no, no, good friends with uh, Soleimani. Okay. Good friends with Soleimani. But politically, we also undermined the protesters. Uh, severely, we've undermined the protesters. At this point, if, if the protests have been completely... You know, that's, that's another point, though. That I don't deny that. What I really deny, though, is the notion that, that we are, are somehow losing uh, the moderate, uh, the moderate um, stand in Iran. We already lost that when we broke the Iran there deal. Were still, there the were still... President, yeah, we did the lose moderate moderates. president of Iran. Here, here's here's my, uh, what I do know about Iranian politics. The current president, that is to say mm -hmm. the elected part of the Islamic Republic, that is the Republican part, as opposed to the Supreme Leader, who is kind of the Islamic part of the Islamic Republic, the elected president is more of a moderate, as opposed to the hardliners in the non-elected part of government. Right. And the moderate side put everything on the table for this Iran deal. The president shredded it, mm -hmm. therefore shredding their credibility. And 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 we've been dealing with fallout ever since. Now, I'm not saying that what the president did withdrawing from the Iran deal was right. But having already done it, what 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 uh, you know, what else was there to lose? The the opportunity to ever go back to Iran deal. I mean, the Iran deal was still actually some of the parts of the Iran deal were still in effect. Now they're completely gone. They're completely you, been thrown out today. They, every, trying every to make 60, that deal with, with the United States again after the U.S. already proved will shred it with a change in office. Well, they were showing that they wanted to. Their 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 activities and how they were dealing with the legislation within the Iran deal was showed that they wanted to. I mean, they were not. They didn't throw it all out day one. They mm -hmm. had a sixty day time frame. That every sixty days they throw a little more piece, a little more piece, and mm -hmm. actually this was at the end of another six day time frame. So instead of just throwing out a little more piece, wait for the next president, they just threw out the entire Iran deal. We hey. completely thrown out the idea of negotiating with them. I'll be back. Randy. One second. Don't start throwing racial stars at each other, okay? Hold on. <laughs> so, if anything, when we when you think about that, we have actually destroyed a lot of our negotiating power going forward if we wanted to make a deal with it because now the moderates are so isolated in the government when it comes to American relations that it's going to be so much more difficult to make any more deal with Iran on a deal that was already extremely difficult, which of course exactly. increases the, uh, uh, the increases the length of time we're going to be in conflict with Iran, which of, of course increases the more opportunities of mistakes to make with the Iranian country. Do you guys think uh, Destiny is is interested in or uh, is uh, interested in this uh, at all? Or yeah, you know, uh, I mean, Destiny this, was interested. In I didn't know the debate I'm was going to happen. Trying, I'm trying to I'm trying to provide a different opinion here. Different right? opinion. Okay, because and, I was really confused. You were coming here just to screw. I think you were screwing with me. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not screwing with you. What I, I'm because I'm not. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not entirely averse to your position. What I'm averse to is the same thing I was averse to in that podcast. Uh, that uh, I, gosh, I, I thought you were. I almost thought you were on it, given that. Um, given that uh, uh, we talked about it right afterward. What I'm averse to is this notion that things are substantially going to change either way. I mean, I just, I don't think, uh, I, I don't think uh, that the United States faces substantially more risk as a result of this death. At the same time, I don't think uh, that this was, uh, you know, necessarily a a well grounded motion, you know, a well a well reasoned decision, given that the president, of course, uh, like I said on the podcast, made this decision based on, uh, or made this decision even after two previous administrations had uh, had rejected it. So I really just, I really question, you know, but, but at the same time, I really question this notion that this is going to fundamentally shake up, uh, shake up our relationship with them. Because I know Pixel Century, for example, said we just pissed off 80 million people. Really? What, really? After, after the sour relationship we've had with the Islamic Republic of Iran, after we overthrew their government in 1953, after the tragic downing of but Iran, that, uh, that, Iran that air in 1988. Yeah, this and is what's going to do it. This isn't is what's going to bring on the that, war. Uh, but isn't it crazy that after all that, there were still protests on the street saying we should stop fighting with America when it comes to Iraq and Lebanon and all these other countries. They were on the street saying you should invest in oil subsidies, invest at home, mm. which put them in a position where they would be much more able to come to the uh, negotiating table coming at the next president. Now that now that has been completely thrown out the window. That All that is at risk now because we've not only undermined the opposition in the country, now everybody in the country has a lot good and complete lock step to be ready for a war with the great Satan. That's what we put ourselves in that position they with this move. They can't possibly be preparing a proxy for a war. war. A proxy okay, war. So that, okay, a proxy war. An expanded war. proxy war. An expanded yeah, proxy war. Or a possible war. Did you want to see the report I just saw today? I read literally like right before I got on the stream that they are moving missiles all across the country. Now that could be for two things. Either to protect uh -huh. it because they expect an eventual uh, American bombardment or it could be to prepare 
four missile strikes. Now, mm -hmm. I don't want to. Now, the likelihoods of a missile strike, of course, are low, but the fact that that's even on the table at this point is scary to me. Dylan, I have to say, when you talk like that about the 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 implications of moving missiles, you remind me of some of the neoconservatives that I talk to on my stream sometimes. Who will say that we have to read so much more into these decisions than we do. Countries posture all the time, engage in military country, exercises yes, all the time. It, it, Russia it, it, just it, released that that uh, that evidence that they've got these new hypersonic missiles. Does that mean we're we're on the edge of war? Or does usually, that mean that they're trying to I would posture agree. for strength? Usually, Usually, I would agree with you, but when you're in these high tense situations, people know that troop movements mean something. When we move troops to the Middle East to protect an embassy, that is a statement. That isn't mm -hmm. just something like they knew that moving those missiles would be seen by the wider world. They knew that. That is a statement during an extremely high, high octane situation. Like, mm -hmm. you think they would just be like, we're going to move these missiles. Oops. Oh, I forgot that we were in this high octane situation <laughs> where they just killed a general. That wasn't something that happened. They knew they know that well, maybe they're doing it because of the high octane situation. Maybe rather than being a sign of war, they are trying to, uh, you know, tell the United States not to attack rather than planning to attack. I mean, I think that's a very reasonable response. I mean, it's like when the United States in response to the Chinese. Uh, Do you think they could be doing uh, both? Well, no, I mean, I imagine they're either doing one or the other. I, I, I think I, they're either pre preparing for war or trying to prevent war. I don't think they can. Well, no, no, no. They can, they can prepare and try to prevent a war at the same time. Well, I mean, I, can, like, I, get, I, mean, I guess I see, I see, like you Finland can take did. actions that would do both, I guess. But I, I don't, I don't like, I get, I think I get what you're saying. Like you could take an action that could, could theoretically contribute to either one. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, like, okay. like for instance, Finland tried to like make peace with Soviet Union while also being like, let's move some shit over here just in case something happens. You know, like yeah, that. I, okay, that yeah, I get what you're time. saying, but I think that is, I think that is very different than saying that we should read the movement of missiles as preparation. Well, what uh, well, they are being for war. Well, they well, well, that's what I just said. It was it was preparation yeah. for war, but a potential war, which yeah. again, I, I think that again, is just they're going so... they're going to have to in the response. They're going to have to politically respond mm -hmm. to this with more aggression. There's just no way the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is not going to allow is just going to allow yeah. it to exist at the same situation it was. Okay. Not only with the trashing of the radio, not only with the trashing of the protests in the country means now mm -hmm. they have less opposition than ever inside for moderates, but also to the fact that we directly attacked one of their most important military resources and then they respond with fucking nothing. Well, mm -hmm. What kind of message would that be sending to the Middle East and their allies like Bashar al-Assad, Lebanon, uh, and Hezbollah? They have to respond in some way or then they lose a lot of regional power. You mean they lose face and so they lose regional power? Exactly. That's part of you it. Know, what, what makes uh, what makes their government so different from from ours, where President Trump oftentimes will fail and fail quite vocally or uh, quite clearly, as he did with North Korea. And instead of acknowledging his failure, he will simply frame it as a victory. Don't you think that in an authoritarian state like Iran, it would be even because Iran has already announced because take of, its own victory lap, irrespective of what reality might be, because it already announced that it was going to respond in multiple ways. Number one, with strikes on Israel through through Hezbollah and number two, through direct revenge attacks. They've already they've already said this. This is a direct statement. It's not something like mm -hmm. when I said direct revenge attack, mm -hmm. what I actually meant mm -hmm. was really mean words. Well, like now, here's an interesting point that you mentioned. They've said, and I'm not saying I know that this is the case or not. I'm relying on your point here. They've said that they are going to uh, 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 use Hezbollah to engage in attacks. Are you saying that's what they said? That they, because uh, That's what Hezbollah said. Okay, so, uh, all right. I, I think that's an important point there because uh, either they're a proxy – or they're not a proxy. That's another thing. Actually, they well, number one, they are a proxy, but but we not only have to take about what Iran's leadership is going to do, we have to talk about the leadership of the proxy in these countries. And we actually, while well, we have some of the best intelligence in the world, if Hezbollah, let's say, decided to launch a missile strike that was not really like an Iran, like Iran mm -hmm. told them to do it, but they launched a missile mm -hmm. strike in response to the Soleimani killing, mm -hmm. because that because you know Hezbollah also likes Soleimani as well. Mm -hmm. We could easily chalk that up to that's Iran. They ordered them to do this. We need mm -hmm. to strike back in some way, which thing that spirals to a larger conflict. So it is, that's why it's so that's why this is uh, another reason why this is so scary. This is, isn't isolated just to one country. This is isolated. This is actually the entire region that this could happen when it comes to the Houthis in Yemen. That could happen to some influence in Bahrain. This could happen when it comes to uh, different militias in Syria. And it could also happen to the, the to the 
Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. You know, that's that's the thing, though. I as far as okay, thinking about how things in that part of the world could possibly get worse. What about when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, our recent, our favorite uh, recent radical uh, militant president of Iran, said, uh, "Our dear Imam," re- referring to Ayatollah Khomeini, said that the occupying regime, that is to say Israel, must be wiped off the map. And this was a very wise statement. We cannot compromise over the issue of Palestine. I mean, if the president that of is, an, is already that saying, is an issue of long term wipe policy. out That's Israel. I mean, I just don't understand how we can we can escalate beyond this point. I, like, I don't understand. I is, I guess your point is they must have more money that let, somehow. Well, let me ask you a question then. Let me ask you a question. When, when, when North Korea says we're going to kick out mm-hmm. the American pig dog or whatever the kind of crazy yeah. statement they say, right? Right. You, is that more of a, a a general statement of stance because we all know they're not going to strike, <laughs> or but would you see that maybe if we killed at North Korean officials <laughs> and then there was a response that maybe was a little more like there will be revenge for this. Okay. Would we not I, be like, hmm, this is a I little think, different. I think at the end of the day, uh, I as much as it, it pains me to say this, Iran and North Korea are ultimately rational actors in the same way that the United States is, which is to say that they will beat their chests in the same way that any American president would. But unlike an American president, there is zero risk, I'd say, of direct attack from one of these regimes, as far as I can say, or because because ultimately a direct attack on the United States is suicide. A proxy. Well, when you say direct so, attack, okay, what it so sounds I wanna, like you're I, First, thinking. I want to I say here, I'm because we, we've been going kind of proxy and then direct attack. Do you believe there's any risk of a direct attack from Iran? What do you mean by direct like on the American in, assets in the region? Say, uh, Iranian assets are, are, are Iranian assets, Iranian soldiers, the Iranian military takes action against the American military or American civilians. A uh, very low risk. Okay. All right. Now I, I, I mean to say, I think by very low risk we can effectively put that off the table. So then we're thinking about proxies, all right? Mm-hmm. We're thinking about proxies. And what I uh, what I don't understand, because I agree with Swamp Steel, for example, in Destiny's Chat, just said Iran has a long history of proxy wars. I don't doubt that in the least. But we've done far worse than uh, kill one of their generals before. We we shot down a rare Iran Air um, Iran Air six five five, I believe. I'm not sure if that was the flight number, but you know, we we've, we've done some pretty tragic that, stuff to that, Iran. That is much different than this, though. That that is a direct attack on civilians. When, when you attack someone, is as that a, worse than killing when, a soldier who I personally in the find, field I find that proxy wars? morally, morally, that's much worse. But strategically, <clears throat> I mean, what? Unless you said there's 290 mm-hmm. were elite soldiers, to strategically, no. I mean, of course, you could talk about like American influence and like how people view America past that point. One second, my camera's messed up. But when it comes to strategic okay. reasons, uh, losing someone like 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 who we both uh, acknowledge that it's, he's a, Soleimani is an extremely important strategic asset to Iran. They cannot just let that go, quote unquote, unpunished. They have to respond in some way, or they lose legitimacy out of government in the region. And then, then let's say what let, let's think what Hezbollah would think. Well, well, if they were allowed to take that America that asset without being with no response, then what about us? And then the Houthis say the same thing, and then and then the militias in uh, in Iraq who have been directly attacked too by us will say the same thing as well. So what what that's doing is undercutting their relationship if they don't have some sort of response in the whole region. And if they lose that regional support, then their whole uh, foreign policy of asymmetrical warfare, what they've been doing for decades now, collapses. Are you telling me that if they don't attack the United, or if they don't uh, uh, further their proxies, their relationship with these entities, which by all accounts depend for their They're existence, the, these entities, Hezbollah, the Houthis, depend on their, in essence, depend on their existence for Iranian support? Are you saying if they don't help? Okay, if, now if that that is, not, that is that is incorrect. The idea right, so, that the Houthis so they, rely they can, on they can, independ- they can independently fight against the U.S., Saudi Arabia uh, without the Houthis? Uh, the without Houthis? Iranian support. Uh, yeah. The Houthis are one of the organizations that have gotten a very limited Iranian support. Not the exact, not nearly the same amount of Hezbollah. The Houthis probably could right. mount, well, not as effective. Definitely could probably hold their ground for a very extended period of time without Iran. Okay, so so then, uh, so then I guess what we're left with Hezbollah. Uh, Hezbollah. I mean, not like, uh, like Hezbollah. Okay, let's talk about Hezbollah then. Well, but no, no, no. We can't just throw that to the side. That that's an organization that could just be. And Yemen, that's an extremely important conflict when it comes but to I'm, that's directly. Thinking... I mean, Yemen allows them access to strikes within Saudi Arabia, which is one of their major enemies in the region. 
Yeah, look, I, I don't doubt that. But, you know, what I what I doubt is like what I'm doubting is that there there's something more they can do. I mean, that Saudi Arabia is already trying to annihilate them. They already have every incentive imaginable to throw everything they can at trying to stop Saudi Arabia. And sure enough, they've already shown that they are willing to do anything that they can do. They bombed uh, I mean, Saudi oil facilities. Well, let's, let's think uh, about how, how these attacks go. Saudi Arabia. When was like, the last – when, how long was there? How long ago was that was that oil attack? Oh, uh, let's see. You remember? Let me, let me I thought it was last year. Um, oh, no, wait. I that, thought it was yeah, this year. Uh, what? September or, well, 2019. Not this year, but, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I, September 2019. Know, now, year, let's right? say that went from every six or five months to every two months or every one yeah. month. The rapid yeah. enough of these attacks not only allow, of course, to escalation just through, through the pure mm-hmm. amount of them, which, of course, they're going to still use pl- plausible deniability like they do with the Houthis, even though that one by directional patterns actually came from Iran, which shows that they are willing to do direct attacks if they can find a way to somehow deny it. Um, wrapping it up to a near monthly or, or, or a near monthly event, or when it comes to Iraq, probably bi-weekly, would definitely increase the, the, the chance for this to escalate into a hot war. If they, why, if they could do that, why oh, wouldn't they sorry, already be doing my, uh, it with their, with their mortal enemy? Just gone plug. One second, I can't hear you. Oh, sure. Yeah, that that link there I go. just now dropped. I can hear you. Okay, all right, good. Yeah, the link I just dropped was the link to the uh, the uh, attack on the state-owned Saudi Aramco oil processing facilities. Also, what did that say well, about Saudi NPR. Arabian? Saudi. Oh yeah. Not only was the the killing of Jamal Khashoggi when it, with the launch, but then then the attack on the infrastructure. I mean, oh my god. And not to mention, it's widely accepted that the amount of oil that they say, which hasn't changed apparently for like twenty years now, the amount of oil yeah. they say that's under Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's just so much that. They screwed up that launch so bad. Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, so the, your point that what if they did it more often? Uh, I, like, the, I guess the question is why wouldn't they be doing it more often already if they could? Because, well, number one, because they've wanted to actually have some chance of a, uh, of a deal. But because they, at the end of the day, they would want to avo- avoid a hot war as well, of course. And, like, doing it more often allows more times for mistakes. I mean, that's part of Solani's policy, which his predecessor most definitely would hold up, that it, you got to be, you have to leave amount of plausible deniability. The more you do these proxy attacks, the more opportunities there are for people to see the direct connections through things like the Iran cables, for example. Um, I mean, the Iran cables was an unprecedented leak of information. Like, that's something that could happen a lot more often if these operations get more widespread. Once you expand any operation, the chances for you to get discovered are a lot more likely. So let me ask you this, Dylan. Uh, You know, there was an attack uh, a few years ago where the United States went after a... uh, it, It violated a country's sovereignty. It, uh, it did so without the consent of that host country. Uh, it, I believe it, uh, it may have caused some collateral damage. And, well, actually, I don't think it did. But it, it, uh, it killed a known acknowledged terrorist who was, in fact, being sheltered by this company or by this country. And nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, I'm talking about the United States uh, violating Pakistani sovereignty, killing their guest the Osama bin Laden, and then <laughs> fleeing, uh, fleeing with the body. Right? So I assume you've heard the Afghanistan papers. I assume you've heard the Afghanistan papers. Uh, well, not all of them. Uh, well, not, but you've read the document. Nice. You've read the Washington Post article? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you know that, I believe it mentions it in there, that uh, Donald Rumsfeld said specifically that he didn't know who our enemies were when it came to the Afghanistan conflict and trying to dome Osama bin Laden. And mm-hmm. Pakistan was the country he was referring to, and eventually he went in there, finally saw he did it, but they're still an ally. Because we can... Re- because Pakistan partially relies on us when it comes to other issues and being our ally. Yeah. The relationship with Iran is completely different than the Iran with Pakistan. It's a lot. It's a, it's, it's a completely different geopolitical yeah, that's, situation. That's, yeah, I'm not sure about that because if Iraq's government wants some some kind of sovereignty, presumably they want to remain a sovereign government. I may be mistaken in that. Maybe the Iranian or the Iraqi government has already decided it wants to become a satellite state of Iran. But if they want some kind of sovereignty, don't they need America's counterbalance anyway? I mean, like I would say the the, the anyway. Iraqi people definitely want want America out and Iran out. Uh, yeah, depends, yeah, of course, it depends on the sect. Are... Depends, of course, but the the government, as we've seen, has immense Iranian influence. Immense Iranian influence. I mean, I don't know if you've read the Iran cables or not. Have you? No, not all of them. Well, in, in the Iran cables, it specifically shows the the immense amount of influence we had. They had all the way up to the prime minister yeah. who had to resign, who's still in office at this point, so but I, had to so resign I, I due to partially that. because of that. I don't doubt that. But what I'm saying is one of two things. Either Iraq has already, as far as their sovereignty goes, has already been lost, in which case, what is there to lose at this point? Or uh, they still have their sovereignty. They presumably still want their sovereignty. And therefore, they need us just like they did before. And they're reacting naturally to a recent event. But over the long term, they still need us if they want to counterbalance against Iran. Yet 
because of we did this that hurts our ability to even stay in the region not because just of like the, the iraqi parliament gained more distance from us forever with them again asking for our troops to leave it was non-binding of course but because that we we threatened sanctions on them which of course makes it seem more like an occupation mm -hmm. um when it when it comes to i mean would you agree that that sounds like an occupation if a nation says leave and we say no we'll put sanctions on you if you make us leave <laughs> yeah look I, the president uh, the president's policy is uh, is characteristically indefensible okay but what what if it okay what if another would okay then how would you stay what if we would like okay then we just leave then well, well just to be clear i'm not trying to defend like president trump as an actor or i know or but then should trump we just leave trump. iraq let me ask you that uh, question. if the country has asked us to leave uh then yeah we should we should uh we should do that okay well I mean, then, provided then, it's, you know i mean i wouldn't just say in that case, in 2003 after we, we just should... invaded but if they've well, got a, a you know if they've got a sovereign but then what you just, so what you're saying we should leave iraq right now because they just asked us to leave the parliament well, now that's the leave. thing didn't they pass like a resolution i mean but a resolution is because a lot of the reasons with american response to it would be sanctions and and well, it would be a hard mm -hmm. american response mm -hmm. yeah yeah look i mean i uh, i'm not uh, i'm not saying we should sanction iran or, or sanction iraq but if the united or if iraq has passed a non-binding resolution then maybe it is possible that they are trying to save face and the united states doesn't need to leave well, I mean, I guess it's possible, but I mean, of course, like they knew going into it, that there would be a hard American response if anything like happened. Like, do you deny that? I mean, I've, uh, I mean, we both know that that would happen. So, what did that? I mean, that's like that's putting it up to chance. Like, we we can see. I mean, this is like Occam's razor, I guess. Well, I don't. I mean, now who who? Um, I'm not sure if uh, I've got our actors straight here. Which which country is uh, taking a chance here? What I mean, Iraq. Okay. Yeah. Look, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're in a difficult part of the world. They are between, uh, you know, Scylla and Charybdis, uh, you know, between a rock and a hard place. Uh, that's a pretty miserable position to be in, but nevertheless, if they want to maintain their sovereignty, yeah, they've got to, they've got to, they want to maintain their, their legitimacy as a government. They've got to make some difficult decisions. I mean, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean and that, fact, uh, that I mean, like, mean that it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, wouldn't it be weird if, 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 I mean, we killed a member of their military, which was yeah. a, a horrible decision. And I think that's something that you yeah. would find indefensible. I would agree. It's horrible. You know, I mean, which, it's, it's, it so absolutely... this strike, but this strike killing Soleimani, there's no way mm -hmm. at that point we could have killed Soleimani without killing that, with that person. That was, that was part of the deal. That was part of the deal because they were, they were mm -hmm. together. They mm -hmm. were together and as well as the five others that died. Look, so I think, um, you know, I think it was like, uh, I think it's like any time that, uh, that, uh, uh, third party actors on un unintended targets are killed. Um, ultimately the United States target? makes the decision to what's that? Was he an unintended target? Well, I, as far as I know, he was an unintended target. I've, I've only heard that Soleimani was the intended that target. Can't that, that, that can't be true. That can't. It can't be true that that was an unintended target. Like we he, must be aware of the collateral look, there. If because well, it, I think that's different than but, saying wait, 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 we want to kill we them. Have attacked ever we, since are, then. we are willing we to have accept the risk. We've continued to strike PMF forces, though. Mm -hmm. We've continued to strike PMF forces since we struck. Mm -hmm. So, so we continue to strike United Iraqi States. military assets. Okay, so this was an intentional attack of, on on both of them. Yeah, not just Suleimani. Suleimani has just been getting the press because he's the bigger figure. Well, they're well, the, well, well of course. States well, the main both. the main intent was to kill Suleimani, but it, we we widely viewed it as like a package deal. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't know. That, I mean, again, if you're saying that's the case, I'd be glad to look and see uh, uh, why, or you know, see see something I mean, that shows that's the case. But I don't know that that's the case anymore. I can look it up, but States I have not read anything. Up a wedding, it intends to blow up the wedding. I think they're just intending to kill one of the terrorists there, and you might. But didn't you know, we like bomb the PMF like a... that kind of policy? But I think that's still uh, an so important why, difference. Why have that. we also bombed the PMF then? Like, I, I I can't speak the specifics of that. Oh, okay then. I mean, I'm talking about we're talking about Suleimani here. And we're talking about uh, about whether uh, Iran has any capacity or means to respond. Well, I mean, they definitely have the means to. I mean, that's, and, and, that's undeniable. And, and that they definitely have the means to. Uh, but whether they have the uh, whether they have the ability to dial things up any more from where they already are, that is what I fundamentally question. Because you know, maybe they can allocate some more funds. Maybe they can make a show of it. But the but Iran has been in low key conflict and sometimes high key, uh, you know, uh, low level and sometimes high level conflict with the United States since the Iranian Revolution. And frankly, this seems like another footnote in the story. Just like you know, a tragic footnote to be sure in its own way. But nevertheless, uh, just like the downing of Iran Air, just like the Kobar Towers attack, just like Iran's terrorist attacks in other countries. I mean. You know, this is this is a, a tragic, a tragic reality, but it doesn't seem to be particularly unprecedented. I mean, 
when we when we talk about the long history of stuff, when 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 tensions continually escalate, any mm -hmm. one of those times those uh, time sensors escalate, that can spiral into a wider conflict, right? So I mean, when we could say it's another footnote of one of the most scary parts of our relationship with the country. One of those scary parts can always turn into a wider conflict, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The more the more uh, uh, more of those scary parts there are, which of course this situation will definitely increase the ability for that to happen in the future. Definitely when it talks to like since the Iran deal is completely fucking dead now, unless we get like the, the debating mastermind in office next. I don't know. <laughs> um, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. Suppose I could prove to you, and of course this is a difficult thing to prove because it depends on his uh, capabilities as a. Uh, as a leader of proxy uh, proxy conflict, suppose I could I could somehow demonstrate that uh, that his capabilities uh, that Suleiman's capability Suleimani's capabilities could not be uh, easily replicated that Iran suffered a real loss and wasn't just being you know it sounds like you were saying uh, you know we've lost one guy we're just going to replace him with another nothing will change well, suppose that's not what I, said I could about. say okay what'd you say I said specifically that um, while his skills cannot be replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who can definitely at least hold up the things he have built. Definitely. Definitely his deputy chief, okay. who was very effective. So, so I, I don't doubt that they can, I, I suppose, maintain what they're doing. But he, he was a uniquely effective actor in Iranian politics. Suppose I could demonstrate uh, that Iran's capabilities had been eroded as a result of this attack. Would you feel any differently about it? Um, not really, no. No. So even if Iran is less I mean, strategic, we're talking of well, well, because of the loss because, of Suleimani. Because then we're moving off of strategic things to my moral implications, right? And my moral okay, implications of, of, of the risk of the human life that this conflict could cause. Definitely when it comes to Iraq. Like, Iraq is almost un undeniable. It's mm -hmm. going to continue to escalate, even without Iranian influence uh, in it. Because it just just the killing of Soleimani and the PMF leader has already called up, of, I think, the Peace Co Company. I, 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 that's a mispronunciation because I don't think there's a good English... Uh, Arabic to English translation. Mm -hmm. of the, of the, I think it's like the Madai force. I can't. I don't exactly remember mm -hmm. how to like pronounce it. They've already been like called up back in the action. Like mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's undeniable that that at least Iraqi forces and American force like there's going to be clashes. It's just it's just a question on how bad it's going to get. So you're saying we're going to lose more lives, more human lives will be lost as a result of the death of this guy. One of, by the way, the staunchest supporters of the Syrian government of Bashar al-Assad in the Syrian civil war. Yep. In effect, a tool used by a brutal regime to kill tens of thousands of people. Yep. Don't we have at least some chance that fewer lives will be lost as a result of this uh, this this aid to brutal and terrorist uh, regimes being killed? Well, I don't know, but I mean, like, for instance, blocking the uh, Saudi UN official from going to the UN today was probably not the best way to like continue to maybe bring back dialogue no, so we can I, stop I, uh, I, yeah again the president president's decisions uh, yeah are, but all uh, this is connected to this decision all of that is, like, that. This is all a there's, no reason, there's no reason Suleimani's attack required the united states to prohibit that prohibit well, one the, escalation uh, from, leads from to other escalations here. right like i mean like that's saying like um for instance like was the killing of like prince archduke ferdinand like like okay like was that good mm -hmm. well i could say it's bad because that helped lead to one of the worst conflicts in the world now you could say well actually that one thing but what about it was all these other things that actually caused the war. Well, oh, yes, but it that escalation itself was the bad thing. That depends helped. on what your goal is. Actually, uh, the killing of Archduke Ferdinand uh, by oh, the boy. Serbian terrorists, the killing of this Austrian Archduke, started off a war that led to the destruction of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had stood for the better part of a thousand years. So maybe, from the perspective of the person who killed him, of course he died. Maybe the Serbian terrorists achieved their goal. You're right. So if Trump's intention is to go to a war with Iran to help him win another election, then maybe that you know, then yeah, there you go. Then I guess you got. I'm not saying intention. that's the case. Maybe it. Maybe he's being honest that his goal was to foil a terrorist plot and save lives. I mean, maybe he is being honest, but I wouldn't actually. When it comes to honesty, I don't think Trump's the person I'm going to trust. <laughs> well, yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't either. Um, but. Uh, I think it is. I think it is. Uh, I think it is worth uh, considering that it is possible that this attack could work out in the favor of the United States, rather than you know just because there are a lot of hypothetical possibilities that this is. Uh, I mean, for know, the United States, loss. definitely, maybe, maybe it could end up like like Iran like backs down and fucking IRGC decides like you know what we'll we'll hold off on this one because apparently our, our ideological leanings are not as extreme as yeah. history has shown, and and you know, but I no, I think no matter what. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's unlikely, but no matter what, the Iraqi people are going to pay severely for this. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I just, I, I think that that's a tough prediction to make, again, considering what they are suffering 
with a reigning influence with uh you know i guess what's left of uh, I, I feel like I mean, this is kind of like suffered and are suffering this is kind of like repl- i mean they're not comparable i mean if this fella has been involved in uh you know has, has been involved in supporting these uh these brutal militias and regimes uh maybe his death will mean less suffering for iraq i mean i feel like I feel like in a lot of ways, this is kind of like replacing, replacing Henry Kissinger with Donald Rumsfeld or Donald Rumsfeld with John Bolton. Like, <laughs> yes, yes, Do- Henry Kissinger is probably one of the most intelligent neocons ever in history. Also, thank you for the subscription. I've I've already exceeded my sub goal for the month in, in, in oh, a day, so that's pretty cool. Good stuff. Uh, but, uh, doing, uh, but, but I do not see this being – I do not see the cost-benefit analysis here. I just think when we go and go into cost-benefit analysis, I think the cost – and definitely the large potential cost. The risk is just too much for me to take any move like this. So you're telling me we're making a cost-benefit analysis? Yeah, cost-benefit analysis. Why not? Okay. Yeah, I'll go for that. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was uh, it was interesting talking talking through this uh, because, you know, I, talking with the conservatives about it, um, where they accused me of caping for terrorists uh, by suggesting that this might not be a slam dunk. Yeah. was uh you know was really uh yeah that was really something else um yeah. but, so would you say this was a more productive conversation than that um yeah i mean you didn't accuse me of being uh let's see what would be the opposite i guess some kind of uh a caping for imperialism maybe oh uh, once again give me a second uh oil man you hate the environment you're gonna burn the uh, world on fire you're gonna turn it all on fire there oh yeah you are evil all. remember oh you feel, yeah, yeah feel better feel better now no i i uh i think uh like if you're going to be if you're going to be burning the oil either way, would it not be better to develop your domestic resources rather than go slay dragons around the world to get easier access to other people's domestic resources? Yeah, but hey, slaying dragons sounds fun though. Well, I'm using I I use the word slay dragons because I think um uh, that was an earlier uh, I, I think uh, Americans should not go overseas to to slay uh, foreign dragons. Um, dragons. Back we in, should slay our domestic back dragons. In, uh, less imperialistic, you know, quote unquote times. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let me, so, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm trying to think if there's, uh, something else I wanted to push back on what she said. Um, okay, I guess not. I mean, I guess your point is just that there's more proxy that they could do that they just haven't done for some reason. Yeah, like, so I guess, like, maintain... to see our, our hindsight to see if this is a good or bad decision. Well, we can't really do it like that, but, like, whether or not it will be good or bad is going to be determined by Iran's response to us. And then mm-hmm. kind of our response to them, and then Iraq's response to us assassinating Soleimani in their airport is going to kind of yeah, you know. yeah. And we also got to wait for Hezbollah's response, uh, what the Houthis do, uh, Bahrain. There's just this is so many factors you have to wait, and you got to wait a while too because this could, uh, this could take what upwards for like two years for like this all to come into play. Like sure. I mean, and then but but then again, it could it could be the fact that like get another president who de-escalates the situation. Mm-hmm. But again, I I am like I'm not willing to take that risk personally. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you folks something. What what are we? You know, I asked you this earlier. What are we doing uh, in chat? What are we doing over there? Is it really worth all of this just to what keep keep Russia with its Mexico-sized economy out of there? Is yes. That, is that uh, well, what this is all about the problem is that we consider. Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states to be crucial U.S. allies. Um, Mm -hmm. And we also consider Turkey to be a crucial U.S. ally as well. And the unification of these three states probably represents um, both an economic harm to the Gulf states and and Turkey and Israel, and probably like an actual like civilian harm as well in terms of their ability to coordinate funding and attacks across borders, assuming all three of these states are aligned. So I, I think that the U.S. does have a vested interest in... He, it, it, whether you like or hate U.S. imperialism, in terms of having our allies like safe, we do have a vested interest in keeping the in keeping Iraq somewhat U.S. loyalist. Yeah, I think that's okay. pretty hard to deny. No, like, wh- how, what would your response to that be, Bastia? Like, how my my question is not. I I don't necessarily. Uh, I I don't necessarily uh, deny that. What I what I'm putting on the table here is, mm-hmm. um, why do we have those vested interests? Well, I mean, so like the, you know, while we're talking in hypotheticals here, do we sure. need? Well, so let's say that we had the opportunity to say, okay, we're going to exit those states. Um, Mm -hmm. We're going to just cede that entire Middle East to Iran, Syria, and um, to Iran, Syria, and Iraq. Um, What do we do then when Russia and China steps in to fill kind of that influential vacuum that the U.S. leaves behind? You know what it sounds like to me? Uh, if uh, well, first of all, I mm-hmm. I would push back on the notion that we are automatically quote unquote ceding this area to Iran when these countries that we're talking about, Iran or rather Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, are some of the richest countries in the world who are more than capable of paying for their own defense. 
But uh, suppose we, we talk about that, and then you talk about Chinese involvement. What does that mean, except that the people who are chiefly burning this oil in the Middle East are now finally paying for the privilege of ensuring that it continues to flow? Well, it's not so much that, that it, it's not just about the oil, right? It's more about like what can happen to U.S. allies when we leave, and, and then like, and then stuff downstream from that. Um, so, like for instance, like um, whew, this is really hard to guesstimate, but like at the very least, we can say that pressure on Israel would increase tremendously if the U.S. exits that region completely. You must agree with that, right? Yeah, no, I, I don't doubt that. But let's just say, let's set Israel aside for a moment. Mm -hmm. First of all, to take this country by country, are there any other countries? that we are specifically interested in, uh, invested in, in defending uh, personally, do we, like, well... I think we're interested we, in I mean, Turkey. Us, yes. Like, ideally, if, if we were in an ideal world, mm -hmm. would the, should the United States really be helping Saudi Arabia, this, this head-shopping police state, with anything? Well, if we had, I, the problem isn't so much as like, should we help them, right? Is that it's not, it's not binary like that. There are other players. Like, would you prefer a Saudi Arabia that's aligned with the United States or a Saudi Arabia that's aligned with Russia and China? Uh, well, it just depends, I guess, on what it is they're going to do with that alignment. I mean, if, it, if they're going to continue on as they are now funding uh, Sunni extremists and selling oil to East Asia, I don't know. I don't know that we're really getting much for the money we're spending on, for the lives we're spending on. What happens if we were to give, so we talk about how puny Russia's economy is, right? Mm -hmm. Can't we to some yeah. extent say that this is probably because of vast U.S. expansionist policy, whether it's via NATO or other countries that we've worked out mm -hmm. where we kind of have this encroaching border on Russia, both economically mm -hmm. and geopolitically? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what if Russia continues to gain power? What if that pipeline that Soleimani was talking about was built between um, Iraq and, um, or, or I'm sorry, between Syria and Iran that gives Iran access to the Mediterranean? Um, you know, what if the Gulf states, you know, somehow did come more under the influence of Russia? Like when, when the thing is, is that like, when we talk about Russia being able to do anything or China being able to do anything or North Korea being able to do anything, there's a lot of pressure from all over the world, not just the United States, but from all over the world and like, hey, fuck off right well would a russia backed by the gulf states be more scary when they roll tanks into places like georgia than an isolated russia right now like, i think that's worth considering I, yeah no it's definitely worth considering but what i am what i'm what the the hypothetical i'm trying to exercise here is the notion that all these countries are i guess fundamentally incapable of looking after their own interests without the united states uh without the united states doing it for them and well, especially no, no. Well, in the, oh wait well, wait okay wait. Thing, I I well, the, it's, it's not so much wait, just the united states worth noting I, uh, here when, with respect to russia and china who are not just a block right russia and china right now often align on you know un votes and things like that but of course in the 1960s russia and china were at each other's necks and china sided with the united states against russia so this isn't like some kind of frozen perpetual kind of uh, duality here china gets its oil from the middle east if russia wants to get involved in the middle east that's a point of conflict between china and russia not just the unending uh, unresisted expansion of russia I would say that the longstanding foreign policy at this point, from what I've seen and what is widely being discussed, there's there's two camps at this point because it's kind. Of, it, it, there's not really many of the like, well, let's rebuild everything because it's largely failed. There's two camps in American foreign policy thought when it comes to the Middle East. One mm -hmm. is that we should make this kind of like a permanent thing. We stay there for a while at a while with at a lesser extent. Like we have five thousand troops in Iraq. That's what I've heard about the Trump administration. They're going to have five thousand troops in Iraq permanently. We we'll have some troops in maybe Afghanistan permanently. There's still some people who want that. Um, and then we can kind of have a permanent thing, which would be a check on power. And the idea behind that is that um, the, the underlying like thought is that China's bad, Russia's bad, America does bad. But at the end of the day, America does less bad. So we should stop them from being the world power because if they're in power, then everything's worse for everybody. And that's the I, that's the basic idea beyond. Do I necessarily agree yeah. with that idea? I don't really agree with that. I think we can we can engage in other ways. And I I, I more prefer the other option. The other option is a slow withdrawal. Uh, which uh, hands over a lot of assets to our allies in the region, and we assist them to like know how you know how to manage themselves and actually mm -hmm. deal with conflicts if things develop. Uh, a slow withdrawal of places out of Afghanistan by the you know making a deal with the mm -hmm. uh, Taliban. Iran deal would have been an immense uh, tool moving forward for this type of plan, which could have then helped us lead later into yeah. making deals with proxy conflicts in uh, Yemen, uh, Lebanon. Uh, uh, Syria and a lot of other things, but that um, with 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 operations that we've just taken hurts our ability to leave unless we leave with literally like Iran like bulldozing everything. Yeah, well, I, I get where you're coming from. I guess the reason I wanted to vet all of that is 
that to me, the reason why we should stay involved in all these countries, even brutal ones like Saudi Arabia that are, you know, I mean, Saudi Arabia with its uh, inability Fuck. to fight a war. In all right, real quick. They, I love you guys. You guys keep talking. I gotta go, okay? Rip on. Okay. Bye. Take care. See you later. Good one, Moot. Yeah, in terms of like, if you want to like moral right to kill him or whatever, that's pretty unquestionable. America absolutely had a right to kill the Soleimani dude, 100.